Okay, um, good morning, everybody. It is a great pleasure to welcome you to this seminar on the occasion of the International Day of UN Peacekeepers. My name is Kari Uslan. I am a senior researcher here at NUPI, and I'm also heading the Peace, Conflict and Development Research Group. This seminar will be live-streamed on NUPI's YouTube channel. So the International Day of Peacekeepers offers a chance to pay tribute to the uniformed and civilian personnel contributing to the work of the UN and to honour the more than 3,800 peacekeepers who lost their lives serving under UN flag. While peacekeeping has been presented as the flagship enterprise of the UN, the record of its successes and failures is mixed. The question that we ask today is, what is the impact of the UN mission in Mali and South Sudan? Researchers from the Effectiveness of Peace Operations Network, EPON, will present their findings from the research on UNMIS and MINUSMA followed by a panel to comment on these findings. But before I leave the floor to Adam Day from UN University, who is the lead author of the study on UNMIS, I will hand over the microphone to my colleague Cedric de Koning, who will give a short presentation on the effectiveness of Peace Operations Network. So Cedric, the floor is yours. Good morning, everyone. Delighted that you could join us uh, on the International Day of UN Peacekeepers. Just a few words about uh, our network uh, that, we, that is behind the research today. Um, the Effectiveness of Peace Operations Network is a global network consisting of more than 40 research institutions that collaborate on uh, research into specific peace operations. So we uh, actually got together in this room in, in 2017 and decided to establish the network. And in 2018, we undertook four studies uh, into the Democratic Republic of Congo, or I should say the United Nations mission in the Democratic Republic of Congo, and the UN missions in Mali and South Sudan. So those are the two that we're going to focus on today, as well as the African Union mission in Somalia. And at the moment, we've got four international teams that are preparing to undertake uh, the next uh, round of studies. And uh, this year we will look into the UN missions in the Central African Republic, uh, into Colombia, and into Darfur, or the African Union United Nations hybrid, ma hybrid uh, operation in Darfur, as well as the European Union and OSCE observer missions in Ukraine. So that's what we are undertaking um, this year and that we hope to share that research with you uh, later. So perhaps just to say that we, our overall aim is to strengthen the effectiveness of peace operations by improving our understanding of how these uh, operations um, have effects or impacts, taking into account the specific contexts, their mandates and the resources that they have available. So we have a methodology that is shared across the different studies. Our ambition over time is also to develop a data set and therefore we, we use this uh, shared methodology. And essentially our methodology focus uh, or uses three analytical tools. We start with a context and conflict analysis. We think it's very important to situate these operations in their specific context. We look at the effects, the intended and unintended effects of these operations uh, in the context of their mandate and resources. And then we employ a number of explanatory factors, things like political primacy, uh, the, the degree to which these operations are people-centered, their legit legitimacy and credibility, uh, national and local ownership, the degree to which uh, they have uh, coordination and coherence, uh, both within and with other actors in the region, and also on women, peace, and security. So these are a number of explanatory factors that you'll probably hear mentioned to, to some degree or other during the course of the morning. And lastly, I would say, uh, perhaps many people ask, okay, what do you mean with effectiveness? This, is, of course, is quite a 
can be quite a, a difficult uh, thing to frame and to approach. But for us, uh, our focus is very much on the overall strategic impact of a peace operation. And we understand that as essentially uh, reducing the conflict dynamics in a particular context uh, over a particular period of time and in the context of the mandate and the resources of the operations. So uh, with that uh, background, let me hand back to Kari, who is going to moderate the, the session, our first session this morning. Thank you. Adam, I think you can just start, please. Thanks so much. I think the microphone's working. Uh, first, thanks to, to Nupi for having me here. I remember being here when, when this network was founded in this room, actually. Um, I will speak about the, the mission we did to South Sudan, um, <clears throat> and I will try to get out of the way fairly quickly so real experts like Zachariah can um, comment on this. But before going into the, the work we did in South Sudan um, in December of 2018, I actually wanted to start in, in 2010 when I was working for the um, UN Department of Peacekeeping Operations and I was in South Sudan and conducted the conflict assessment for South Sudan that was the basis for the mission that was later deployed um, and that is currently deployed there. And one thing I think is really interesting to think about is how our analysis differs then to what it is now. In 2010, we saw the major risks of conflict in South Sudan to be north-south conflict, conflict between Sudan and South Sudan. We saw the major cause of instability to be a lack of state capacity outside of major rural, uh, major urban areas. And, and we saw the local intercommunal issues as fairly localized, but there was a risk of escalation uh, at the time. Um, this analysis really shaped what the size and shape of, of UNMIS was at the time. There was a large military presence along the, the northern border of South Sudan. Um, and the huge bulk of the mission and the mandate was focused on state building, extending state authority from the center to the periphery of the country. And at the time, there were 1,100 civilian staff um, in UNMIS deployed to focus on capacity building. That was the shape and the mandate of the mission in, in 2011 when it was deployed. And, and really, when the Civil War broke out in 2013, I think this really underscored how much of this we got wrong. Um, and frankly, there wasn't, we didn't see a major north-south conflict emerge. Um, and what really seemed to fuel conflict at the time was this large, what some people call a patronage network, but a large network um, that couldn't hold itself together, that had been put together through the, through the war. But when um, the oil revenues were shut off in 2012 and money couldn't flow through the network, it didn't hold together very well. And, and really that what we thought of in 2010 as localized intercommunal issues really pointed to a much larger set of rifts within the country that ended up breaking apart in 2013. And really one of the findings that I'll come to at the end is, is the question of whether the state building approach and capacity building uh, orientation of, of UNMIS in, in 2011, did that potentially contribute to some of those rifts and some of those um, dynamics rather than fix it? So then you come to 2014, which is when the, the mandate of UNMIS shifted following the outbreak of civil war, and the mission shifted from being focused very much on state building to being focused on protection of civilians. And this was because there were millions of people displaced by the uh, civil war, 400,000 people, some estimates say, were killed as a result or indirect or direct result of the war. And so the mandate shifted from state building to protection of civilians, facilitating humanitarian delivery, um, human rights monitoring, and uh, support to the political process. And that kind of frames what our work in 2018 was. Our work was to evaluate really that mandate. But it's, I think it's important to start with the 2010 moment because it shows that the mission in 2018 was doing something extremely different than what it was set up to do originally and what its uh, mandate and resources were set up to do in 2011. So in, in, in December of 2018, uh, a small team traveled to, to Juba, and we conducted a series of um, interviews, focus groups, um, uh, discussions with government, non-government, UN, NGO, civil society. We ended up meeting um, 260 people in the end, um, conducted several focus groups, traveled to four locations, Bentubor, Yambio, and Malakal. And, um, and also did some meetings in, in regional hubs like Addis and Nairobi. So uh, that was the basis on which we, um, we um, issued our report. And what we really looked for as a first point was evidence of impact in the four mandate areas. And I think 
one, one thing to think about as, as potential researchers is starting with a positive question. What is the evidence of impact is a very different uh, question than saying, how is the mission doing? And I think it also changed our dynamics with our interlocutors because it forces everyone to think about what is the, the, the positive um, evidence of impact. And I think it's remarkable going through the four areas how much there was. Um, under protection of civilians, there were 200,000 people that had been protected inside the unmissed protection sites. Um, that's 200,000 people who otherwise were considered extremely vulnerable during the Civil War. Many of our interlocutors said that by removing these civilians from the conflict, it probably prevented a genocide. Um, there was a clear sense that uh, many tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of lives had been saved just by virtue of creating a perimeter for these people um, to, to stay in. Um, and that also had a knock-on benefit um, because humanitarian delivery could happen in a concentrated way. And so I think just on its face, this is a fairly undertold story. When you think about the work of, of the UN in peacekeeping, very few people would start off by saying 200,000 lives were probably saved by a peacekeeping mission. You usually start with much more negative stories. And I think also on the protection side, there are a lot of local level activities that the UN was doing, brokering local deals. I remember the UN sent me um, a list of something like 45 local conflicts that had been facilitated in one way or another by the UN. Um, and in those areas, you can see a, a reduction in, in um, civilian casualties over time. And I think you could probably create a quantitative list of how many lives that saved. But I think more just to say that there's much more going on at the local level than you tend to see in the public reporting. And it, it seemed to have an impact, although we all come to some ways in which that may be limited. Um, under humanitarian delivery, again, starting with a positive, um, we... Um, essentially uncovered that around 100,000, between 100,000 and 200,000 people received life-saving humanitarian aid as a result of unmisses, opening of corridors, force protection, activities like that. And I think that's a remarkable number when you think, I mean, it's a small number when you think about the number of vulnerable people. But when you think about South Sudan as a place that has very poor infrastructure, very few paved roads, opening access is actually one of the most important things you can do. And in a conflict zone, opening access in areas where, uh, where otherwise humanitarian actors wouldn't be able to go is actually quite an important um, uh, act in itself. So again, I think that's a story that hasn't been told so much. And many of the humanitarian agencies I talked to focused more on the ways in which UNMIS didn't offer access or failed to respond quickly. But starting with that positive question, you end up with a, an, interesting, um, an interesting outcome. Uh, don't worry, this won't all be positive news about UNMIS. Um, under human rights, uh, the new leadership in the mission had certainly increased the tempo and I'd say the depth of human rights reporting. There was reports focused on government obstructions to humanitarian aid. There was reports showing atrocities by both the opposition and the government um, against civilians. The, the real question is what impact does that reporting have? And here I found that perceptions differed a lot. Some especially UN interlocutors thought this gives us another leverage point to talk to the actors and try to get them to uh, limit atrocities. Others said these were just pieces of paper that float around and didn't have impact. So it was really difficult, I think, and, and one of the challenges with EPON is how do you show impact in these areas? How does human rights reporting actually affect change? And I'll, co I'll come to um, the, the broader question about kind of correlation and causation in a minute. But I found it very difficult to say anything definitive about the human rights reporting. Um, although some of the work on, on building judicial capacity and things may be uh, another area. On the political process, again, I think there was a sense that um, the UN had good access and trust with some of the, the key actors and that the access had helped maybe bridge some dialogue. But it was very difficult to say that, that UNMIS itself was directly supporting the, the, the national or, or regional um, political process in a way that could be measured in the kind of analysis we were doing. That doesn't mean they weren't doing it, but I think it, it, um, it is a difficult thing to say definitively. And, and I'll come to some of the methodological issues in a minute. That said, I think there was a sense that these local peace process, this local support, bringing people together uh, who, who had been opposed during the war, was playing a beneficial role in stopping things from escalating while the peace process was going on. And that was a perception that, that went across most of the interlocutors that, that we spoke to. Um, 
and this kind of leads to some of the big challenges that I faced when trying to talk about impact. One is that um, correlation doesn't equal causation. And so, for example, you could look at a graph that shows that human rights violations go down over time following a large human rights report. That could be due to the rainy season and the fact that people tend to fight uh, during certain periods of the year. It could have nothing to do with the human rights reporting. Similarly, you could have um, the SRSG holding a series of meetings or participating in a series of meetings with political parties after which there was some sort of resolution to a conflict or some sort of um, progress on, a, on an element of the peace deal. Very difficult to say what the SRSG did actually was the, the causal factor. And I think talking about contribution rather than causation is a starting point. Um, but this is where the perceptions really matter. And one of the things I'd like to do more with, uh, with EPON, that we did, these focus groups were good. Having surveys of 2,000, 3,000 individuals would help shore up what, what a, a broader number of people actually think the impact is. But I think it's also, um, in these kind of situations, South Sudan is an extremely divided society in, in many respects. And, and what I found is when I talked to some groups of people, they'd say, oh, the UN is having a huge beneficial impact on the peace process. And then another group of people would say, actually, this is a waste of time and, 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 and resources. And very difficult to come up with a definitive um, kind of causation argument. The other challenge I faced was, was bad data um, in the sense that Unlike national armies or police or even um, kind of local police who have live tracking of what their actors are doing, the UN doesn't actually have the ability to have um, a time-stamped mapping of where all the peacekeepers are going at a given time. So if, a, if there's a risk of conflict in a certain area and you have an early warning, um, the UN doesn't say, within two hours, we sent peacekeepers here and the casualty rate was this before and the casualty rate was that after. What you get is every three months, the UN says, we did 3,421 patrols during this time period and here's what the overall number of fatalities were. That's an extremely useless tool for making arguments about, um, about causation and, and limiting civilian casualties and whether or not peacekeeping is actually effective. And I think some of the um, academic work around it does peacekeeping work and some of the studies that try to build a more rigorous methodology, frankly, I'm not persuaded that we are able to tell a story that peacekeepers deploying to a certain area have a deterrent effect, have a limiting effect on, um, on casualties. And um, <coughs> I've written a bit about this, but I think having much more detailed, time-stamped data about when and where peacekeepers go will help us start building a better story about whether peacekeeping works. Um, and I think one of the other things about this study is it exposed some of the dilemmas that peacekeeping is facing more generally. Um, and I think South Sudan actually has some unique, um, unique dilemmas, but that may point towards other um, uh, peacekeeping uh, issues. One is the short-term protection versus longer-term um, protection issues. In South Sudan, you have hundreds of thousands of people who are, f are receiving protection in a, in a perimeter, but they don't want to spend the rest of their lives there. They either want to go back to their homes from where they were displaced or maybe to another area. And decisions about how to support or facilitate that movement can have real repercussions for longer-term um, conditions for these vulnerable people. If they stay in in the protection sites, they'll receive services and, and life-saving aid, but they won't ever be able to return to the economies where they were before. If they go back to the, the homes where they were living, and largely in the urban areas, they may face uh, protection risks again, including from government actors. Um, and that may be a short-term risk that the UN is unwilling to, to support. If um, as is happening in places like Bor, large numbers of people are being sent back to their kind of what they're called ancestral homelands, although many people have never been there, but places where their um, ethnic group has a kind of majority, that may alleviate the immediate protection risks, but it may mean the country is much more divided in the long term along ethnic lines. And I think the UN isn't necessarily the right actor to be making those decisions, but because the UN is often the actor that's deciding where to put services, where to put water, where to put education, um, where to facilitate movement, it often ends up being a question that lands on the UN's doorstep. And I think this short-term protection versus longer-term peace is a big question that arises in a situation with hundreds of thousands of people displaced. And one where, I mean, I don't have an answer, but I think that um, in South Sudan, the question is more acute than elsewhere just because of the immediate protection actions that the UN is doing. And then I think another dilemma, which it has to do with capacity building. I started today talking about the huge emphasis on capacity building in, in 2011. 
there is a push to move back into the era of capacity building, to build institutional capacities, to put more money into, and resources into um, kind of state institutions, rule of law, justice, and things like that. But we have to remember that in 2011, that was seen by many South Sudanese as putting a finger on the scales, as helping one group over other groups, and helping Kier's affiliates uh, as against others, uh, President Kier's. Um, and I think this is a really important question for peacekeeping to think about in general. When you say we have a capacity building mandate, what does that actually mean? Does that mean you're just supporting government institutions? Does it mean you're also supporting a broader range of civil society? Um, and how do you balance that without um, creating new divides or new tensions um, within the country? I don't have an answer to that, by the way. Um, and then I think one of the most important things is, is what people actually said to us. Uh, some of it's in the report, but overwhelmingly, when I asked young people in particular what they wanted or needed in their country, they said roads. They said, we need to be able to move across and around this country, access places where we can get jobs, and, and, and move between the cities where there, there's the possibility of us making a living. Um, Miss almost does nothing on building roads, frankly, and they've done some small um, bits and pieces. But I think that there's a pretty big disconnect between what the young people of South Sudan are saying they need and what the UN says it needs to do. And I think if we look across Epon um, interviews, I'm guessing that there's going to be essentially a large number of uh, respondents from within the countries who are saying what we need is development and infrastructure, whereas what the UN is saying, what well, we need more peacekeepers and, and better kind of capacities to do um, maybe capacity building. And I think starting to bridge that divide and talking about how the perceptions within a country may not match what the UN is, is set up to do is an important question. I'm almost done. Um, I think really in conclusion, the, the big picture is that UNMIS has had a remarkable impact in an area where many peacekeeping operations don't. Um, I've worked in four or five peacekeeping operations and almost none of them can say we've saved 100,000 lives. Most of them would actually, when you look in the public realm, would say they were probably oversaw the loss of many lives. And I'm not saying that UNMIS hasn't fallen short, and there are um, many public reports that show how far short it fell when, when protection of civilian sites were attacked and when there were opportunities to respond more quickly. But I think that's an important starting point, especially on Peacekeepers Day when we're trying to kind of herald peacekeeping. Um, but I think the bigger question, and this goes to Cedric's point about strategic impact, is the support in the protection of civilian sites, is the local level um, reconciliation work, is the work to facilitate humanitarian delivery and report on human rights, is that leading to a strategic impact? Is it influencing the trajectory of the country in a positive way? And frankly, I have to say, I don't know. And, and many of the South Sudanese interlocutors I talked to were pretty skeptical that the UN was actually playing a meaningful role in tilting the country. Uh, more towards peace and, and, and if you think about what the major issues are now in South Sudan, the, the peace process is extremely fragile. Issues like cantonment of the military groups um, are, look like they may not work in the medium term. Is the UN capable of supporting that and, and helping edge that in a positive direction? The answer is I, I really don't know. And against all of the positive things I've said, there are also some of the unintended consequences, to use a title that in one of Cedric's works. Um, which is, it's possible that the UN also creates dependencies. The enormous amount of humanitarian aid since Operation Lifeline Sudan in the early 90s up until now has meant that government institutions haven't had to do education or basic services because they're always being offset by the international community. And I think it's important that you start trying to balance these positives with the dependencies and the negatives and, and some of the others. I don't have answers to all of that in our report, but what we hope to generate, I think, through Ipon is a bit more evidence so that the discussion um, has more meaning behind it and reflects the perceptions of the people and country a bit more than traditional UN reporting. And hopefully that gives you a sense of what's in the report um, and looking forward to hearing reactions to it and, and what all of you have to say. Thank you. Thank you so much, <clears throat> Adam, for sharing the main finding of this very interesting report. I would now like to introduce, and it's a pleasure to introduce, Brigadier General Wang Chuang Ying, who is commander of Sector West in UNMIS. Brigadier General Wang has also served in the first UN peacekeeping mission 
that was established on this day in 1948, the UN Truce Supervising Organization, UNSO. The Brigadier General will have a short PowerPoint presentation. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Kari. Good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. And thank you, uh, New P, for inviting me. Uh, I'm the guy from the ground. I'm not at the strategic level as you did, but I do have something on the ground. Next slide, please. Can you? Yeah, I can. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. So. This one, yes. Actually, in South Sudan, this is the uh, threat assessment from our military side from South Sudan. John, I think you are familiar with that. And John is my, was my deputy commander in Sector West. And nice to have you here. Very good. This is the uh, <coughs> threat analysis. We do have those security concerns in South Sudan. For example, the <coughs> intercommunal clashes, the cattle raid, especially the militarization of cattle raiding. And also, we have killings here and there because of cattle raid. <coughs> Excuse me. And also, there are some possible spoilers to the uh, revitalized uh, peace agreement, which was signed last year. <coughs> Excuse me. So, those are the uh, parameters or variables that might hamper the peace process in South Sudan. I dare to say, ladies and gentlemen, you, have, may, you may have been informed that the transitional period, which is supposed to be the 12th of May of this year, right? But it is postponed for another six months. So, so there are, I'd like to say, some spoilers behind to the piece of process. And uh, very happily, uh, on the 15th of March of this year, the Security Council passed a new resolution concerning the Army's United Nations mission in South Sudan. And in this new resolution, you may have, you may, you may, you may can, you can find some of the uh, new changes to the mandates of the, uh, of armies. In the past, we had four pillars, but now we have five pillars. Again, protection of civilians is the priority. And the second, that is a new one, to foster a secure environment for the safe, informed, voluntary, and the return and the relocation of IEDPs and the refugees. So we, ARMIS is working hard for providing technical assistance to those IDPs and refugees to return from their protection sites, POC sites, to their homes. So we're working out very, very hard on that. And also, we try to create suitable conditions for the delivery of humanitarian assistance. For example, the HMAX in armies are working on the uh, main supply route maintenance for the delivery of humanitarian assistance all over South Sudan. And also we monitor and investigate 
investigate human rights violations. And last but not least, we support, we give full support to the implementation of the revitalized peace agreement. But ladies and gentlemen, army is, is facing challenges. Personally, personally, besides the challenges to state building and capacity building you have mentioned, I do have two challenges for the, uh, as far as the operation, military operation is concerned. First, the militarization of cattle raiding. Second, that is vastness of error responsibility. John, I think you are familiar with the second one. Yeah, that's the one we worked out when you and me we worked together in sector west of armies. The militarization of cattle raiding, the traditional practice, has escalated into political violence, which might be which make it impossible for the safe environment for the return of IDPs. Whenever there is a cattle raid violence, whenever there is a military cat, militarized cattle raiding, more and more people will be displaced. For example, in the March violence in Kawajana of Wau, in the neighborhood of Wau, of my area of responsibility, more than third, th third thousand of people, the local population, were displaced because of the cattle raid of, uh, of the uh, Tongji cattle keepers from Tongji. That is the neighboring state of uh, the western Bahala Gaza. So this Cattle militarization of cattle raiding caused more deaths and more IDPs. You may have noticed in one news that is uh, in the uh, early of January 21st of this year, according to this news report, 105 people were killed in one cattle raid incident. So this militarization of cattle raiding happens frequently in South Sudan. For this and our recommendations are coordination among armies, citizens, and the pre-transitional government of South Sudan for the demilitarization of cattle keepers, for the disarmament of the cattle keepers. And I have recommended many, many times to SISG and the force commander of armies, we need to have the enhancing in our mandate, the disarmament process. So if the weapons of the cattle keepers are taken away, the militarization of cattle keeping, the traditional practice will become traditional not killing. So that is the first challenge. The second challenge, the vastness of error of res responsibility, not only for our uh, sector west, but all for the other sectors. For example, in our sector west, we do have those places with no UN footprint. This is contradictory to the implementation of our mandate to bring as many UN footprints to the area of South Sudan as possible. So the fact, the effect can be the possibility, a paucity of force and the inability to expand army's footprints to faraway areas. For this challenge, our challenge is to stretch our, the stretching of forces from static duties 
to outreach operations. And also we need to set up some of the AOBs or TOBs in those far away areas. For example, in the west of in the west part of western Bahalagada of South Sudan. So those are the recommendations we have made to the uh, leadership, senior leaders, leadership of armies. And very happily again, according to the new SISG directive, which was issued very recently, so in, in this implementation phase, we reduce our static, static operations of the uh, battalions to bring them to as far as possible to have more UN footprint over there. For example, nowadays we have independent TCC patrols to have more engagement with the local population. So that is one thing. The other thing is that for the HMAX, you know, in those at maintenance areas for the HMAX, the engineers, we have false protection to them. But now, according to this di new directive, in, this, in those green areas, we can remove the uh, false protection to the HMAX so that our battalions can have more independent military operations. So those are the changes to what is uh, what you have raised in the uh, new P report. So I think I do not have enough time. No, it's right? Okay, a few minutes so, more. Uh, then I leave you some time for interaction, for questions. Ladies and gentlemen, do you have any questions for me? I'm on the ground. If you have something about what is the operation on the ground in the field, I'd like to uh, be happy to take those questions. Yes. Uh, Brigadier General, I would just suggest that we take the questions afterwards because we will have a panel here. Oh, we shall have okay. a panel later on. Yes, so then uh, you will get the chance to ask uh, questions, okay? Okay, very good. Then thank you very much. Thank you, so thank much. you for your attention. Thank you so much, Brigadier General <coughs> Wang, for sharing a more operational view on the situation uh, in Anmis and South Sudan today, and also the challenges that you see. Now it's a great pleasure to introduce Sakaria Ding Akol, civil society representative from the Sud Institute in Duba. Akol is the director of training, and his research interests include the role of civil society organizations in peace building, traditional leadership and democratic governance, post-conflict reconstruction, and dy the dynamics of civil war. Uh, Sakaria, the floor is yours, please. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I would like to appreciate um, Nubi and Adam, who I interacted with when he, he came to do uh, the data collection uh, for the report that, that is being launched today. So I'm happy to have, to have the opportunity to speak uh, after the two gentlemen. The commander is on the ground, uh, but I'm also on the ground as an analyst and also a South Sudanese. Um, if I were to give a letter grade to UNMIS, I would give it a C. And I would give it a C not because of what the dedicated men and women uh, not, 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 not because of lack of dedication and commitment from the men and women that are working on the ground, but I would give it a C because of the disconnect from the ground and the political leadership at the higher level. 
especially in New York from UN headquarters. Like Adam said, ANMIS was set up in 2011. And really, in 2011, the focus was that uh, there may be a major violence between South Sudan and Sudan. And ONMIS was established there to help in an eventuality like that. And so while there was no major conflict, although there were skirmishes here and there between Sudan and South Sudan, for example, in Abia and in Hijlich or Pantho in 2012, UNMIS virtually was not doing anything. Uh, the issue of cattle raiding that the general talked about was happening and killings were going on. I think you recall what happened in, uh, in Pibor in 2012 between the Murale and the Lord Nuer. And Anmis did not seem to have did not seem to have any mandate or any anything to do with it at that time. In twenty twelve in twenty thirteen, I led a team uh, where we work with in collaboration with the Stevenson Center in Washington to assess uh, the mandate of UN uh, uh, armies to protect civilians. And we went to northern Barcazal, one of the areas that was shown on the map that the commander showed us. And I must say, when I, when I went on the ground, people and communities who were supposed to be protected by armies were not even aware that UNMIS was there for them, to protect them. They were sitting in their base in a wheel, and they would go up the road from a wheel to Gongmachar in the border with Sudan, or near the border with Sudan. And all the citizens were seeing was that there were white vehicles moving up and down. But no one was aware of what these white vehicles were doing. I attempted to talk to them in a wheel, the, the mission there, the political affairs, and they chose not to engage. They were dodging the questions. And we were simply saying, we are researchers. These are, this is what the community is saying about your mission. You have a mission to protect them, and we wanted to know what mechanisms you have put in place in order to protect them. And to protect them from what? And what do they do when something happens? There were no answers. I went there three times, leaving, leaving business cards, promised that someone would call you, and no one called me for more than two weeks in the field until I came back to Juba. Uh, it is true that there is a value, especially in light of the ongoing conflict, which started in 2013, there is a value in terms of what UNMIS has done. The 2,000, 200,000 people, or 200,000 plus people that Adam was talking about is real, and there is a value to talk about that as an achievement. But these people are people who have run to the UNMIS and they have not been pursued, and they are sitting there. Yunmis does not come out to protect people who are being threatened. And in some cases, the basis of Yunmis itself have been turned into scenes where people lost their lives. Malakal, people were killing Malakal. At the start of the conflict in 2013, people were killing Akobo. In the UNMIS camp, they were dragged out and killed. They were from my area, who were local administrators from uh, Zhonglei, current Zhonglei state, and they were killed because of belonging to an, a different ethnic group. Uh, in Bor, people were killed in 2014 inside the camp. 
as recent as a few months ago, fightings have been going on in the UNMIS camp in Juba, which is the largest. And guns were even used there in the UNMIS camp. And there have been reports of people coming out at night from the UNMIS camp with guns to commit crimes. And UNMIS has confirmed this. Uh, so that is, that is the reality of what is going on. UNMIS is there, but UNMIS is being challenged. And there are two main challenges to UNMIS besides what the, the operational challenges. There are the strategic challenges. One is that UNMIS is not seen as neutral <coughs> by the parties. Both the government and the armed opposition don't see UNMIS as neutral. And especially for the government, the government reads the activities and the actions of, the, of New York as acts of bad faith. And they don't separate UNMIS, which is on the ground, and the, and the Security Council. You are aware the uh, Security Council has sanctioned a number of senior government officials, people who are directly responsible for security, including the current chief of general staff and the former chief of general staff and some other generals. And they've been attempted to sanction uh, Minister of Defense and Minister of Foreign Affairs, uh, Cabinet Affairs and Minister of Information. But thankfully, some countries oppose that in the Security Council, and that did not happen. But if that were to happen, on the one hand, you want cooperation. On the other, you are seen as engaged in a, in a, in a direct confrontation with the same person that you are supposed to cooperate. I think there is a disconnect, and there is a problem, and that is an issue that goes deep to the issue of trust. The second challenge is the way UNMIS started, especially the, when the conflict started. The, people, the person who was responsible for UNMIS, the first uh, SRSG, Hilda Johnson, is someone during, who during the war played a very big role in show, showing support for the people of South Sudan. And in the course of the time, she developed relationship with some of the would-be generals, the cabinet ministers, uh, the members of parliament. So when the war broke out, and it was this same group that was divided, Hilda was seen as being on one side with those that are on the other side by, by the government, especially those in the opposition. She was being seen as closer to the people who were detained, the former, the former detainees. The same applies to the first U.S. ambassador, uh, Susan Page. Both ladies work in support of the people of South Sudan uh, during the war leading up to the negotiation of the Comprehensive Peace Agreement. But now, with the independent South Sudan, they were both appointed, one heading on miss, the other one uh, representing the U.S. government. And when the conflict started, they were both seen by the government as supporting the opposition. And that has not helped uh, the case of UNMIS. Uh, and that is why I said if I were to give a later grade, I would give UNMIS C. Not because of the people on the ground, people like General, but because of the way decisions are being made in New York. And sometimes opinions on the ground are disregarded by people who don't know facts very far away from New York, or people who are making political decisions. Uh, and I know this because I work very closely with both political affairs and civil affairs of UNMIS as a researcher. Uh, I'm also in the Secretariat of the South Sudan National Dialogue, a process that is going on. We just concluded a regional conference for the region of Upper Nile uh, before I came here. And UNMIS uh, David Shearer, the SRSG, SRSG has been supportive, uh, and, and, and UNDP has been supporting of this process, and then and Japan. Um, but the rest, and this process 
for many South Sudanese, the national dialogue process is the most important process, most, more important than the peace agreement. But sometimes the way the international actors, especially one, once far away, make their decisions, they pity one, pit one against another. So for the South Sudanese, the peace agreement is an elite agreement which allows them to come together. They are struggling to come together, but we give them that space. But we say the bottom-up approach, bottom approach, which is the national dialogue, must be supported. And sometimes people choose one or the other, and we say, no, 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 you don't have the choice. Both of them are important. You need the elite to have an agreement that can bring them together so that there is some kind of a stability or at least silencing of the guns. But then to go deeper into the issues that divide people and to reach a consensus, you have to engage in this bottom-up approach. And we have been struggling. When the National Dialogue was launched, uh, it was announced first in December 2016, but then in 2017, it, it started in May, uh, people were boycotting it. There have been unanimous, those who were sympathetic and want to support, on the ground they were told, stay away. This, this, is, this, is, this is not the way to, to go. But that process has pushed on regardless. Then the peace agreement, when the talks moved from Addis to Khartoum, and I think the manner in which the Sudanese manage the talks close the, you know, by closing the, uh, some, some international actors out, then they started to talk against the process. And some started coming back and say, oh, we are now with the national dialogue, not so much with the revitalized agreement. And our response to them as South Sudanese is, hey, listen, you people, we want this thing to end. And you must support uh, the two processes because they complement each other. Uh, lastly, I think if we are to be honest, we cannot put all the expectations in terms of stabilizing a country called South Sudan on UNMIS because that is not the work of UNMIS. The primary responsibility of protection of the South Sudanese citizens is the work of the government, not a foreign body like UNMIS. And after all, uh, UNMIS as a, as a mission is a mission that gets resources from countries, and countries retain control over those resources. For example, the battalions that come from different countries, they struggle to have one unified structure and command. And people who have come, who are paid to do their job, they are not necessarily going to risk their life. They are not soldiers of South Sudan. So a good case is the situation that happened in 2016 where the humanitarian workers were assaulted not very far from the base of UNMIS, and UNMIS did not come out. It did not, UNMIS did not come out, and not that they did not know, but they were afraid, because if they were to come out in the middle of the fight, and they, they are seen by one side as supporting the other side, then it was going to be a problem. And maybe there were other challenges. So it took the same government forces to really come to rescue the people who have been assaulted. And I think things like this don't paint a very good picture of UNMIS, especially the mandate to protect civilians. The civilians that are protected are ones that have run, but the many millions that are out there, who is responsible to protect them? Unless the mission is that you protect civilians that are in your, in your base. But if they are South Sudanese civilians, then I'm not sure that's the best way to protect. The resources that are there could be better used than the way they are being used. Talking of the disconnect, uh, the deployment of the regional protection force, something that was decided very urgently when the fighting were going on, the fighting was going on in 2016, in July 2016. Then months later, the situation changed. But look, the same forces were brought. Now they are in Juba, they are an inconvenience, quite honestly. Every time I drive on the road and I see them patrolling, 
around J1 and around the parliament, I really want to stop and tell them, listen, why are you wasting my time? Can you please find a better thing to do? But they are there because they are told that's their mandate. But the environment has changed completely, 360. So there are, there are resources that are being used, but are they being used in a right manner? But again, who can change that mandate? It is New York, not people on the ground. The people on the ground are asked to implement what they are told to implement. I think I, I better stop here. Uh, those are some of the, the comments that I can make. Thank you very much. So, um, Brigadier General uh, Wang, uh, Adam and uh, Zakaria, please join me here. Get my glass. And thank you so much, uh, Zakaria, for, for bringing the attention to what should be the center of gravity, uh, the people on the ground. Um, and I think um, the three of you complemented each other in a very good way. Uh, talking about the challenges, but from very different perspectives. And um, in the interest of time, because we are going to focus afterwards on Mali, I would, um, I would open up uh, for comments and questions. But I just wanted to, to give justice to Adam, because I, I said a few words about both of you. I didn't say really anything That's about fine. you. I mean, <laughs> you mentioned yourself that uh, you had been working in different UN missions. But just very briefly, you have been working in, in um, the DRC, in Lebanon, in um, Darfur, uh, in Khartoum, and also for DPA and DPKO. And you've been working for civil society organizations and um, also for several justice um, protection initiatives. A long time ago. Yes. <laughs> you can Google them all. You will find quite a lot of information. They are very impressive, the three of them. So with those words, um, I would invite uh, you to, um, to ask questions, comments. I see... Um, many knowledge knowledgeable people in the audience. Uh, I see also many partners of the EPON network. I would ask you when, when you ask your question to please um, say your name and your institutional affiliation if you have one. So please, the gentleman over there, we have a microphone. But I don't, okay, now yes. So good morning. My name is uh, Jose Barona. I'm the, the emergency director with Norwegian Refugee Council. And uh, at the time, I was in South Sudan uh, when the war started uh, for two years. Before, during the breakout and during the first few months of the war, I worked with Zacharias. I was in another organization at the time. So first, uh, to thank uh, to thank you and Miss because part of uh, my team saved their lives thanks to running into UN MIS uh, bases in Juba and in Malakal. And uh, some of them will probably have been killed if they wouldn't have been able to run into the UN MIS bases. So they definitely saved the lives of hundreds of thousands of people, as you say in the report. And many humanitarian workers as well were saved thanks to UN MIS protection. I have a comment and a question. The comment, uh, it is true that 200,000 people, even more, I think at the time, saved their lives because going into the UN MIS bases, but that happened thanks to the people, not to UN MIS. So it was not planned. There were there was no messages in the radio to say people come to the bases, we will protect you. They were completely unprepared, unexpected. Uh, I was in in Juba on the bases the first few days. Uh, we were quickly digging latrines, uh, bringing water, because there were basically 25,000 people in the mud, uh, with nowhere to, no food, no water, no facilities, nothing. So it's something that happened, I think, thanks more to the people of South Sudan who had the initiative to run into the UN Miss space. And of course, UN Miss couldn't close the door. Uh, and then, but it was not something that was prepared, and something that is a lesson learned maybe for other missions as well. And my question is, is is probably to the colleagues, the two colleagues from UNMIS, uh, I mean the researcher and, and the colleague, the general from UNMIS. I, I wonder 
has, have the UN missions, UN miss and others. After UN, after South Sudan, I, I've been working and living in Congo for four years, and I hear the same criticism. There is shooting, we are attacked, and the UN miss or in Congo, Monusco, don't come out to protect us. They do the patrolling. If we run into the barracks, we are protected. But if there is an attack, they are here 200 meters from us. They never come out. They never protect us. They come the following day and they do the research very well. And they asked how many of you were killed, how many were injured, how many men, how many women. But when the shooting is happening, they don't come out. We have the investigation in 2016, the incident that Zacharias mentioned. And of course, the whole world knows we had two colleagues raped, internationals, etc. And this is the, west, the question why you and me didn't come out. They were a few meters, a few hundred meters away. But I don't know why we wonder, because that is what always happened with the, 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 the South Sudanese or the Congolese. Usually, the UN Miss don't come out to engage and chase away people attacking civilians. So my question is, should they, so <coughs> do they have the mandate? And, uh, and is, is that a realistic expectation that the UN Miss will engage to chase people out to protect civilians? Yes or no? If the answer is yes, why this very seldom happens? If the answer is no, then why we all expect that it is a yes? So, uh, then it needs to be better explained, probably, that, look, with our mandate, with our capacity, we will not be able to protect people outside our bases. Clear? And then there is no that expectation. Thank you very much. If it is okay with you, I will collect a few more questions. Is that okay? Yes. Yes. So there was a lady behind there, please. Yeah. Hi, uh, Ilaria Carrozza from PRIO. Thanks for your, your presentations. I guess my question speaks to what um, Zakaria was saying, but it is really for the whole panel. Um, so we keep hearing that we need to give local ownership, uh, or we, we need to give ownership to uh, local, to the locals uh, on the ground. Um, and then, but like you said, um, the government really is responsible. The responsibility uh, for local ownership shouldn't be put on you and Miss. But then I was wondering, what do you think, um, what would you like uh, in practice to be done by you and Miss or other international actors to facilitate, if anything, uh, local ownership of peace processes? Thank you. Thank you very much. I'll take one more question now and then we will take a new round afterwards. So um, there, please. Uh, my name is Endre Stiansen, I'm now with UNDP, but I used to work for the Norwegian government, including being a Norwegian special envoy to Sudan and South Sudan during the negotiations uh, up till really 2015, so I've been very much part of this. Of course, there's a lot I could um, want to comment on, but I would like to also compliment all three presentations. I thought they were very interesting, very honest, and especially I liked uh, you, Zachary, for bringing out say, the South Sudanese perspective. And then just one comment, but you don't need to comment on this, but just one comment. We have somebody here from South Sudan, the civil society, from and Miss Underground, we have from the UN. We don't have anybody here from the government. And I think that would have been very interesting to complement this panel, but maybe that's for next time. Now, my question, and this really is for all of you, but, uh, but maybe Adam and maybe Zachary could answer it. And that has to do with, you know, what has gone wrong, I think, in South Sudan, to a very large extent, has been the failure of, a, say, a proper, meaningful, constructive dialogue between the UN system, maybe, uh, international community, and the local government. Is there, is there structural reasons for this? Is it personality reasons, as you seem to hint, uh, Zachary? Or are there other reasons? And I think unless we're able to kind of come to grip with that issue, it'll be very, very difficult to, to make progress. Thank you so much, Andra. And then I will uh, let you, do you want to start, uh, Zachariah? Sure. Um, I think the, the, f the first question that I, I would like to say something about was what could be done to ensure local ownership? Um, well, now the, the country is divided, as Adam mentioned. Um, the, the supporters of the opposition um, have one side, and then the government and the, those that, that support it uh, on the other. So, but I think what could be done uh, is to have dialogue, uh, which is the, question, the second question to have dialogue that brings together 
the different groups, the South Sudanese, the parties that have divided the country on the one hand, or, or bringing them together with the international actors that are, that, that are there, and UNMIS. UNMIS is, a, is an umbrella, but it is allowed to function uh, if it is seen as, as okay. Uh, because otherwise countries, the other countries, especially the powerful ones, reserve the right to, to do something different than what UNMIS uh, may want to do. But I think um, there is, there, it has to be, I think it is known that the primary protection, no matter how many forces you bring to South Sudan uh, on the part of UNMIS, you are not going to pacify the country because it is not it is not their primary mandate, and that's why uh, UNMIS doesn't come out, because if it comes out when fighting is going on, then one side may say, okay, uh, UNMIS is, is on that side, and it, it can be a problem. So they try to remain neutral, but then when they remain neutral, in the process a lot of carnage takes place, and it's made it out against uh, people that that UNMIS is supposed to protect. So if you have dialogue, dialogue where, uh, and, and we have been saying this from the said Institute, what has been going on since the conflict erupted is that both the government and the international community are not, they, they talk at each other. You just run to where the mic is and grab the, whatever mic you can grab and say whatever you can say without sitting. I think there is a need for dialogue to happen where the international community comes to the government and say it is your primary responsibility to, pro to, pr responsibility to protect the civilians, but we are here to provide support. What, how are you challenged? What can you do and what can we do to support you? That, that has not been, been the case. And for the government, it is, you know, this bad faith is started with the people who were seen, who were the leaders, like the leader of UNMIS that I mentioned. And David Shera seems to, to, to be okay, because when he came, he came uh, after the war has started and he was not in. But maybe if he stays long, people will begin to put him in a, in a, in a, in a, in a camp. But for now, he's seen as, as neutral. He can talk to the opposition. He can talk to the government. But they, they, they starting, at the start of the conflict, there has been not a dialogue, and the government feels that it is always equated with the opposition. And the government says that we are part of UN, and UN is here at our uh, acceptance. We are the ones to okay uh, the UN for it to do its activities. And if the UN is not cooperating with us or is seen as undermining what we are doing, then we are going to undermine the UN. And that was why the government objected to uh, protect the RPF. But then they allowed them when it was no longer uh, necessary. And, 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 and RPF is there. No one could change the mandate, but the mandate is obsolete, but, but they are there and the resources that are brought are being used in a in a way that is not strategic. So I think having dialogue and actually listening to what the South Sudanese are saying, especially supporting the ongoing efforts for the national dialogue, would be the way of ensuring a local, non local ownership. When the national dialogue was launched, people were skeptical because the opposition was saying, well, it is a monologue, a monologue. Uh, people from one side are going to talk. But really, if you see the documents that have been uh, released, the people have spoken. They have spoken their minds. People were consulted in the country and outside, in Uganda, in Kenya, in Ethiopia, in Sudan, those refugees, and they have given their opinions. And those opinions are there. Now the conferences are trying to consolidate uh, whatever the consensus would be on the issues. And so they, uh, the two conferences are done. They, Bargaza Regional Conference, the Upper Nile Regional Conference just concluded on Saturday, uh, before I came here on Monday, uh, and the Equatorial Conference will follow. 
and after that there will be a national uh, a national uh, conference and the national conference is most likely going to happen at the time uh, the RT Gono will be formed so it is it is it is it, we we think that if there is engagement of the parties now that the opposition parties are on board with the exception of IO Riege said he is on board with the national dialogue and he sent a team but then he has refused to 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 confirm these people so so in the last conference they they came but they were sitting as observers not as not 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 as uh, delegates uh, to the conference which is what we would have prepared uh, so so there are challenges but to engage I think is the way engage the, engaging the parties so that the, many horrible things have happened but life has to move on we cannot be fix, fixated on what has happened rather what can we learn what can we say we have learned from what has happened and what can we do in order to move forward and avoid recurrence of whatever bad situation that had happened it seems so far that uh, anger and there's anger and there's bitterness, bitterness and there is mistrust uh, that is going on on both sides and that is in the way of dialogue it, it, it stops people from genuinely dialoguing there are people who think that those in the government who have been in the government since the crisis started you know don't have any use at all to be around and so they prefer that these people uh, would somehow disappear the problem is they are not going to disappear for any time any, any time soon so should we wait for their disappearance or should we say hey, listen why are you doing some of this you have done this and we have seen it but this is not good this is why we are saying these people are not talking to each other in a more uh, more more honest and more engaging manner that's, that's what I would say as an answer to to both so the ownership is recognizing what the people of South Sudan are saying especially now in the national dialogue process but 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 there are people are holding out who are saying the dialogue process uh, it is not where they want it to be well how can you have something where you want it to be if you are not even there to begin with I apologize, Secretary. I just in um, I hesitate to stop you, but uh, because these are very complex uh, questions uh, which require longer answers. But I'm wondering if we can try to be brief. I don't want know if you want to finish. No, I'm, that no, I'm good. I'm good. No, I'm good. No, because then I would I would like to to give you the possibility to answer. Also, if I could ask you uh, to be a bit brief so that we can have a quick round. There are a few people uh, that would like to ask. Please. Oh. Um, so I take the question of uh, the protection of civilians, because the protection of civilians is of uh, priority uh, mandate. Now, uh, the uh, two points I, uh, I would uh, to brief you uh, on this protection of civilians. On the level of uh, senior mission leadership, as I have briefed, in the new SISG's directive, we try to put our limited military resources to for the protection of civilians outside the POC camp. So as you mentioned, outside the POC camp, there are lots of local civilians who are displaced. So that's why we have more TCC independent patrols to put the military as far as they can at, for the patrol as a deterrence to the killings, to the injuries of the civilians in the neighborhood of the, uh, the UN compound or in the far reaching areas. So that is the, on the uh, uh, senior mission leadership level, there is the new SISG directive on the ground, on the ground, we take more actions. So, um, on actually, armies is not only neutral, but also impartial. Impartiality means we take actions 
against anything that that against the protection of civilians. I will show you my experience when the uh, Kawajana cattle raiding happened in early of March. When the accident happened, of course, a series of killings and injuries to the civilians. Me, as the Sector West commander, I had engagement with both the SSPDF commander, the 5th Division commander, and the IO commander, both are major generals, in the western Bahlagada area. I had engagement with those two commanders. I tell these two commanders, you have to stop the killings. You have to take actions. You have to protect the civilians. Armies is here. Armies is here to felicitate the protection of civilians, to support either SSPDF and IO to protect the civilians. So this is the appearance. This is what I did on the ground. So now our policy, the army's policy, in one word, is to protect civilians, not only in the POC sites, but also outside, in the whole overall country of South Sudan. So that's my answer to your question. Am I brief? That's great. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Quite OK. <laughs> no, that's great. Adam? Sure. On the, on the protection question, I think it's important to notice that um, when I was there, at least, the overwhelming bulk of the military resources of UNMIS were actually around the perimeters of these POC sites. And this directive is great. But um, in, in Bohr, for example, the SRSG said that 0.6% of the vulnerable population was inside the camp, whereas 70 to 90% of UNMIS resources were being used on the perimeter of the camp. So it's a question of, of trade-offs of resources. How much of your resources are actually available to go out and patrol when they're being used around the perimeter? And that's one of the reasons that there's a strong push to move people outside the protection sites because it's seen that then you free up resources to do more patrolling. For me, the bigger question is whether patrolling works. And Zachariah pointed out that, that the people see the white cars driving around all over the place. I talked to dozens of people who said, we don't see any protective presence when these cars drive from city to city and then go back. And I think it raises the question of what types of patrol work, what types of presence actually gives people a sense that they can return to their villages and go about their day-to-day -day lives. And I'm not going to answer that right now, but I just say that there are different types of presences the UN can have, from just driving in a straight line and back, to driving, getting out, spending a couple of days, to flying in and creating a two-week two presence, to establishing an austere operating base. There are a lot of different ways in which the UN can get out there, and having a real conversation about which one of those does protection better, I think, is a good starting point to that question. On the um, Ilaria's point about local ownership and, and Andre's point about I, those seem kind of linked, I, I think much of it's been addressed. One point I'll say is there's always this tension between inclusivity and effectiveness that happens in peace processes. When I worked on Darfur, we tried to get as many rebel groups into the room as possible, but then you lose the focus and you lose the ability to actually create a, a coherent process. In 2015, one of the reasons the peace process was seen not to have worked was that it only involved two parties and there were lots of other actors who weren't brought in, and so then they saw the need to spoil the process to become involved. I'm not saying that's necessarily accurate, but it's a perception I saw a lot. Now what you have is a real push for inclusivity and get everybody in the room and have civil society participating. What tends to happen there is you end up with a kind of abundance of voices, but not necessarily all of them have the same weight or are meaningfully incorporated into a process. Again, I don't have the answer, but I think just saying inclusivity and just saying local ownership doesn't necessarily solve the problem and doesn't necessarily mean that all the voices will actually result in a meaningful agreement. I think the re revitalized agreement has a lot of the elements that the 2015 agreement didn't have. It doesn't mean that the implementation is set up to actually bring the result. The final, the final point I will, I will make, although I had several other written down, uh, Zachary's, Zachary's point about um, don't fixate on what has happened but move forward. This was an interesting point that came up a lot, and I think there's a real division on the peace versus justice, peace and justice issue. You have these huge atrocities that happen, sexual violence in, in conflict is a war crime, and then um, human rights so section and others have documented large-scale atrocities. And my question is, can you have 
a peace process that has a justice section that isn't implemented? Can it move forward? Do you need a hybrid court? Do you need actual processes? Or are the South Sudanese actually capable of just pushing forward? I think it's a real question, and one where we're sitting in a Nordic country that has a track record of talking about justice a lot. This isn't a question that we can answer in this room. This is a question that when Zakaria talks in the national dialogue format, they need to come up with their own formulation for justice. And one thing I'd, hesi I'd be hesitant to do is impose our idea of a certain type of court or certain type of justice system on their process. But we have to acknowledge that, that those atrocities did take place and that can't just be a kind of compartmentalized issue within the peace process. Okay, thank you so much. We are, we are already um, going into the coffee break, but um, I'll, I'll give you the chance uh, if you can you can use one minute uh, <coughs> on the question, the two of you, because there are several other others who asked for, for the floor, but uh, we will have a, a new session soon on Mali. But if you want to, to ask a question or come with a comment uh, in one minute, and I'll give the three of you one minute each <laughs> to answer, and then we will break up for a coffee. Uh, please, Anna Kerste. Thank you. Uh, I'm Anne Kjersti Frøholm. I work in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. I'm the Ministry's uh, coordinator for UN Peace Operations. I have one question concerning capacity building and the decision to exclude that from the mandate after uh, 2013 and the conflict. Was that the right decision? I mean, yes, I do understand that it could um, lead to a perception that UNMIS was being partial, but on the other hand, it could also lead to perhaps uh, have a stabilizing effect and also prepare the country better for peace. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry. Nikolai Hegden, University of Oslo. Uh, just very short. Uh, you said there was a push for capacitor building again now. Uh, what, uh, I'm just curious, what drives that that agenda and that disconnect between, you, you told about you know, the youth wanting infrastructure projects, et cetera, but the donors in the UN wanting capacity building and state building. I just recently talked to some experts on fragile states, et cetera, and they said that that agenda had lost some steam because of the results, et cetera. But, so what drives that agenda? We're Thank you so much. So one minute uh, each, <laughs> please, Adam, Oof. first. Um, first, I think there are a lot of different conceptions of what capacity building is. and. If you look at the big drive in the Pathways for Peace and these other kind of intellectual exercises, um, understanding it not necessarily as a state-centric set of activities is a good way to think about capacity building that might not fall into the traps that happened between 2011 and 2013, building up um, other capacities, um, including organizations like Zacharias and others that, are, that have, sh have a track record of, of um, positive results. I think. The reason it was excluded was because the Security Council wanted to punish the government of South Sudan for participating in the war. I mean, that's a, it's a pretty clear moment where they say, we were giving resources to the government, now we're going to stop giving resources to the government, we're cutting you off. And now there's a he real hesitance to bring it back in. They talk about technical advice and assistance as the, the modality for um, providing support. And I think what's implicit behind that is technical advice and assistance doesn't mean resources per se. It can mean individuals going in and, and providing advice. And so I think there's a real hesitance within the international community to start pouring resources back in. And if you look at the Troika um, actors who were the ones, that, including your government, um, who were giving huge resources in the CPA context, I don't think we're going to go back to that setup um, at all. And already you see the Americans are largely withdrawn from that kind of mindset, as are the Brits. So I think um, there needs to be a discussion about what types of support actually result in conflict resolution capacities, in reduction of risk capacities, that aren't necessarily throwing a bunch of money into the Ministry of Justice and assuming that that's going to result in a kind of linear progression towards lowered instability. That model clearly doesn't work. Um, I don't have an answer in the 10 seconds that remains, but I think having a real discussion about redefining and um, kind of reprogramming capacity building in the UN context would be a useful one to have. Thank you so much, Adam. So uh, uh, as to uh, the capacity building, uh, uh, just a, a brief comment on that. One of the uh, key uh, success factors of UN peacekeeping, for us people on the ground, is the uh, promotion of local ownership. So this is closely related to uh, the capacity building. In South Sudan, during this pre-transitional <laughs> period, armies is working closely, as far as I know, with the local governance. For example, in the regional dialogue, 
you mentioned in Western Bahalagada, where Chung Wa Yoda Adam, so we are were fully engaged. And for the national dialogue, for the uh, Joint Defense Board, Joint Defense Board is to have the decision of the cantonment size for the SSPDF and the IOs, and armies, both armies, military and civilian components are fully engaged. So that is our, uh, that is not written in the mandate, but in the implementation of the mandate, we are doing something for the promotion of local ownership uh, with the ultimate goal of the capacity building. That's all. Thank you. Thank you yeah. so much. Sakaria, please. Well, capacity building, as Adam said, you know, means a lot of things. And um, when before the war, the resources that were there, uh, one can ask whether they were, you know, whether they were used successfully or not. Because uh, I ran into someone in 2012 uh, with Adam Smith International, who was an uh, advisor, security advisor, a senior person, former military officer, um, responsible for Western Bargazal, former Western Bargazal and Northern Bargazal, uh, as part of the security sector transformation. Well, the outbreak of violence itself is confirmed that there was no much transformation or security reform agenda that was done. And yet, uh, the Americans and the British, uh, both DFID and, 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 uh, and, um, and uh, USAID, uh, spent a lot of money. The, mo the American money were given to, uh, to Blue Shield, uh, who brought in security ex military experts and security advisors. But they, they were doing nothing. I even got a chance to ride with this guy that I met in Western Baragazal, who was going to Kwajuk, and he had two vehicles. He said, I have a stupid policy that cannot let me have one car. So two cars are rented for me, so that when I'm traveling, I have two cars. So please don't, don't hire your own car. Use this other extra car. There's only a driver in it. And this guy, you know, told me everything, but the money was wasted. But he was happy because he was paying his mortgage at home. So it depends on what, and yet it was money for capacity building in support of the state. But much of it was spent on the personnel who were going. Maybe 20% was going into the, to the economy or to, uh, to, to, you know, to achieve what it was meant to achieve. And I'm not sure it was achieved because the world would have not broken out. Onmis was there to keep peace. Then where was the peace? in 2013 when everything was flying. Yeah, that's a, a grim note to, to end on, but uh, thank you so much, and uh, I apologize for, for the short time. Uh, thank you to all of you. I hope you will continue joining us for the next session on Mali. Uh, so we were supposed to start the next session at 11 o'clock. But the coffee's out there, so I would suggest that we all uh, stretch uh, our legs a bit, get a cup of coffee, and come back here in a few minutes, please. Thank you so much to the panel. Thank you. Thank you.
Welcome back from tea. Uh, we're continuing with our uh, special seminar this morning in uh, commemoration of the International Day of United Nations Peacekeepers. Thank you very much for a very rich session we had uh, this morning already on, on uh, South Sudan and the impact and effectiveness of the United Nations mission in South Sudan. And uh, we are continuing now with a focus on the United Nations mission uh, in Mali, uh, MINUSMA. We're going to follow the same uh, process that we introduced earlier. So we have the lead author of the uh, AirPon report, uh, Yahir van der Leyen. Uh, he's going to introduce the report and then we will have a panel that will uh, comment and contribute and discuss the report as well. Uh, Yahir is with CIPRI and I just wanted to, to highlight that this is a network of different research institutions. So we have a number of uh, members of the network uh, in the room here with us today, PRU, uh, Nudafik, the National Defense University College, the National Police University College in Norway and, and several other partners, the uh, University of Tromso, uh, I see here as well. And uh, we have a very interesting model. We have a model where each partner pays for their own research. Uh, so it's a self-funded collaborative effort. Um, but we also have uh, support from the Norwegian Research Council for the network itself as well as support from the Norwegian Ministry of Foreign Affairs for the research we are doing uh, in part through the Training for Peace project as well as the United Nations Peace Operations Program. So we are very grateful for both the partners who are investing their own uh, research uh, funding as well as the Research Council and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs for enabling and supporting this network. So let me turn next to uh, Yair to introduce uh, the MINUSMA report and then I'll introduce uh, Sharon and Natasha who's going to join us on the panel. Thank you, Yair. say uh, about our team, uh, uh, Natasha was part of our team when we went to uh, Mali, we went to Mali twice, uh, Joel Karlsruhe was in the, in the team, uh, but we Bangladesh, uh, Germany, and uh, Lina Darfa, for example. And the Kofi Annan International Peacekeeping Training Center. Exactly. Thank you. Uh, and our uh, uh, counterpart, actually, in MINUSMA was Sharon Vihata, who is also going to uh, be part of this panel. And um, what we did was we held uh, a large number of interviews with uh, um, um, staff in MINUSMA, with uh, other missions in the country. Um, with uh, Eventually, we had a consultant uh, also doing interviews um, with uh, uh, local uh, um, the lo local government uh, uh, representatives. We organized focus group meetings, uh, a very large one in Bamako. We went to Gao, where we also had a focus group meeting, and we went to uh, Mopti, where we also held a focus group meeting. Um, so, what I will do in, in my presentation is I will touch on three things. First, the uh, effectiveness and the impact of MINUSPA. Uh, then I'll touch on a number of uh, strategic policy dilemmas, and you may actually recognize at least one clearly from the previous uh, uh, session. And uh, uh, I'll touch on a number of strategic policy options for the mission. To start with, um, I would say that if you, if you look at the impact of MINUSMA, we're talking about contribution, as David already um, uh, said, um, Adam, sorry. Um, we're looking at contribution, and uh, then I think that we should move to the third slide just to give you an impression. But, oh, I got a clicker. Yeah. This is the number of conflict-related deaths in Mali. And, um, 
you have to look at the mission. It, uh, uh, it follows after a large uh, um, conflict, let's say, in 2012, where from the north, rebels uh, come south towards Bamako. Once they reach sort of halfway, um, the French say, this is it, we have to intervene. And that's <coughs> Operation Serval. Um, they are complemented later on by an African-led mission, uh, AFISMA, and that mission is reheaded as MINUSMA. Um, so what you see is, is a lot of conflict-related deaths in 2012, 2013, and then in 2013 when MINUSMA is um, deployed, it, um, it goes down, the number of fatalities. And I think that the, the fact that uh, MINUSMA was there contributed to this. What you could also say is that MINUSMA contributed to the return of uh, a whole number of uh, internally displaced persons. It contributed to the uh, organization of elections in 2013. And it definitely had a large role to play in the peace agreement, the Algiers peace agreement in 2015 which in the end would provide the political framework for at least dealing with the, the north-south conflict in, uh, in Mali. Um, yeah, at the moment, basically, by and large, what you can say is the mission has two main aims. One is uh, 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 dealing with, well, Algeria's agreement uh, implementation uh, and that is stabilization and protection of civilians as well. I would lump that all together as basically saying ending the conflict. Um, that's what you see in, in, uh, in, in this graph as well. Um, and how it is doing, I'll, I'll get into that as well. Uh, and the second aim is um, supporting the government um, in expanding uh, state authority to the whole of the country. So. Looking at this da uh, these data, and then l particularly looking and focusing at the conflict-related deaths, I think there are two stories to tell here. First, um, if you look at, at post-2013, you see a decline in, in uh, uh, the number of, of, of uh, deaths. Uh, that conflict was primarily um, the conflict between the North and the South. Um, that conflict um, in, in, in 2015, by and large, came to an end with the Algiers Agreement. But um, jihadists have continued to, to attack um, the, uh, uh, the signatory parties to the Algiers Agreement, and they have continued to attack MINUSMA. At the same time, what you see is that after the signing of the peace agreement in 2015, 2016, then in 2017, 2018, the number of fatalities increase again. Uh, and that is, to a large extent, the problem in the center of the country. In the center of the country, there is a different problem. It's, it's very different from, let's say, you know, north-south. In the center of the country, uh, you have jihadists who stoked uh, uh, tensions, a government that responded, and the, the government responded um, by, for example, using ethnic militias, uh, by uh, perhaps even over-responding, and as a result what you see is a, is a vicious circle of, um, um, you know, attacks leading to a retreating government, uh, uh, at the same time overreacting with uh, militias, um, leading to more fear amongst different groups in the center, uh, and uh, retaliation, retaliation, things are slowly running out of control. Um, this is ethnic intercommunal violence in the center. Um, it's uh, uh, much more local and localized and much more fragmented than the north-south conflict. Um, well, then the second thing, the restoration of state authority. Here you can see maybe, you know, in 2016 the mission was very successful. Up to 2016 it was very successful. Uh, but after that, you know, it's losing control 
probably if it if it ever has been in control um, because of what happens in the south or in the center of the country then supporting uh, uh, the restoration of state authority uh, these are the data from uh, uh, the Friedrich Ebert Stiftung uh, it's uh, Mali Metra surveys and I use them because they kind of reflect what we heard in our focus group meetings and I made a division um, by, by uh, disaggregating the, the, the averages for the different regions um, the northern regions the central regions and the southern regions basically what you see is that uh, originally, the, the satisfaction with the government was pretty high um, until basically after the Algiers Agreement. And after that, it goes down uh, uh, both in the center, the south, and the north. Um, in the north, there is the least uh, satisfaction. The center and the, the, uh, the south is more or less equal. Uh, I singled out the, the, the region of Kidal because it's uh, a very different case again. There uh, it goes down and down and down, almost through the ground. Um, yeah, but uh, uh, on average in the north, there is at least still 50% uh, satisfaction, same in the center and the south. Um, but what it shows is actually there is also a lot of dissatisfaction with the government. And why is that? Well, in large parts of the country, the government is not seen as inclusive. At least in many localities in the center and in the north, it is not seen as that inclusive. Um, it is uh, uh, not always seen as legitimate. And uh, at times, it's even seen as a predatory actor. And that's a challenge. The mission has raised uh, uh, many early warnings early on before 2015, 2016, that things were going down um, in, in the center. Um, and uh, uh, that it said, it, it said, you know, we need to act on this. We're, we're seeing that things are going wrong in the center. We need to act. Uh, the government did not have an interest in that at that stage. They did not want to have uh, an international presence in the center. Um, but the conflict there is also very different. It's localized, it's fragmented, so you might actually wonder whether uh, uh, MINUSMA has something to add to, to the conflict. Um, and also, um, members in the Security Council were not necessarily supportive of it because, you know, it's, again, more resources needed. Um, so things escalated in the center. Then the next one is how is MINUSMA appreciated? Again, looking at the data. And here what you see is uh, initially everyone was very hopeful. Mm. The UN is going to help us. And that's great. Uh, you already see you know, a decline in, in support for the mission or appreciation of what it is achieving. Um, and, uh, uh, but it's still more or less actually at the same levels as, you know, appreciation of the government. Uh, what is interesting here is there, there is a regional uh, difference. Um, appreciation for the mission is highest in the north. And often that is justified with the fact that uh, uh, MINUSMA is involved in lots of uh, quick impact projects. It is involved in stabilization projects, and uh, uh, that is uh, seen as, as uh, you know a good thing, and that's why they appreciate, or that's what they appreciate. It is lowest in the south. In the south, many people don't really see the benefits of the mission. Um, they actually would like to see it fight the terrorists or the rebels, which it is not doing. Um, and therefore, they are disappointed, and in fact, uh, uh, they see it as an infringement on the, the sovereignty of the state, uh, in some ways comparable to some in, in South Sudan. In the center, it is also relatively low, but there, the main complaint is 
MINUSMA is not doing enough. It should do more. It should do more to protect the local population. If you ask people uh, uh, in interviews, you know, what is your reflection on the mission, then people will often say, well, you know, we have this complaint, that complaint, that complaint, and they can list on all these complaints forever and ever. Uh, but then if you ask them, so what if the mission were not there? That's where you get the answer. <coughs> oh, well, in that case, things would be much worse. Um, and I think that tells a lot. At the moment, the mission basically finds itself at, at a cross, crossroads. Uh, uh, it needs time to solve the problems in the north. It needs the resources uh, to deal with the situation in the center. Um, but time is not really on the side of uh, MINUSMA. And the resources, uh, it's not very likely that it gets more resources from the Security Council. Um, and I think that its, de uh, its success depends uh, to a large extent on how it is able to deal with a number of, of uh, policy dilemmas. And that's where we end with, or where, where I head into the policy dilemmas. Um, the first one is the mission at the moment, um, the, the civilian component is by and large concentrated in Bamako. And a lot of the tension, particularly militarily, uh, has been on uh, the north. It is now giving more military attention also in the center, but the bulk is still in the north. And the question is, should the mission decentralize or not? Um, the reason why the, the civilian component has been centralized pr primarily in Bamako is uh, uh, for, for uh, logistical reasons. It's a vast country. It's very difficult to move people around. Uh, and also to protect them, so security challenges as well. Uh, and at the same time, it's actually useful to have the civilian component in Bamako as well because it supports uh, uh, MINUSMA's role in institution building. Uh, at the same time, decentralization may also mean uh, 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 spreading the mission thin. Um, but at the same time, particularly the civilian component is needed elsewhere in, uh, uh, in the country. Uh, and also, you know, looking at the military component, what are you going to do with it? Uh, it, it needs to spread towards the center. And this is the second dilemma. Uh, are you going to concentrate on the north, the center, or on both? The north is not solved. It still needs its attention. Uh, uh, there is a need for the mission to be there and basically contribute to confidence building. And uh, uh, particularly, actually, in two hotspots, in Kidal and in Manaka, Mala, uh, Menaka, so mixing up countries here, uh, Menaka. <laughs> um, but also the other regions in the north, actually, you know, in spite of the, the, the relatively l little violence at the moment, uh, it requires the tension to stay stable. Because if you were to withdraw all resources from those regions, there is a risk that things destabilize again, and eventually that may lead to the north slipping away again. Um, the center is crying for help, particularly in terms of protection of civilians. Um, the government's use of, of militias, for example, uh, has, has only escalated uh, matters. Uh, it, the fact that it retreated uh, uh, also meant that, you know, jihadists could actually step into the situation. Um, and if we, if we let that all continue, and if we let it escalate further and further, uh, there is a risk that not only the center further destabilizes, but eventually the broader the country, and eventually the whole West African region. Um, so yeah, there is a need to actually then focus on both regions. Um, that would probably be the best solution. At the same time, there is a risk that if you do that, then the parties can continue actually to dodge their responsibilities uh, and, and hide behind, you know, MINUSMA is not doing what it's supposed to do. Then the third strategic policy uh, dilemma is linking up with the government or not. We already discussed quite a bit about this in the previous session. Um, and it's very much about you know, local ownership, national ownership. And I think there's a difference as well. 
national ownership, the government primarily, local ownership, having everyone included. Um, MINUSMA's mandate is very much tied to the state. Expansion of, of state authority. Uh, the state is basically the, the primary interlocutor. Um, and, uh, uh, um, you know, is, is guiding the process. Um, and, of course, that, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, basically, that's the way it should be. The government should be in charge. Um, it should guide the process. And it is also the exit strategy of any mission, basically. Problem here is it should be an inclusive government, and it should be perceived to be inclusive by all. And that is not always the case, as we know in South Sudan and in in Mali as well. Um, if, if it is seen as predatory by some, then you know how are you going to deal with that? And that actually puts the mission in a, in a sort of awkward situation because in order to be a mediator, you have to be impartial. If you are tied to one of the parties in a conflict, basically, or as a party that is not really seen as you know, that inclusive, um, then you know how can you fulfill the whole depth of your of your mandate um, and in spite of, of having a human rights due diligence policy uh, supporting the government uh, uh, particularly um, may actually in the end currently fuel the conflict then the fourth uh, 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 dilemma is supporting counterterrorism uh, and go back or, or go back to uh, to basics um, and there um, what you can see is actually that the current situation where uh, a mission is involved in a broader international strategy of counter-terrorism efforts, uh, where you also have, in addition to the, the, uh, the Malian armed forces, the FAMA, uh, that are doing their thing, let's say, the French intervention, Balkan, uh, and uh, the regional operation, the G5 Sahel Force. Um, they try to deal with the problem. Um, but the things are just for escalating further. Um, and here again, you know, there is a need to deal with jihadists in the region because they are stoking, they are creating, you know, virtual, they, they are making use basically of the virtual grounds for uh, uh, making the conflict bigger. But at the same time, the way it is done right now is highly problematic. Um, because it has been fueling the conflict rather than actually stopping it. Um, it has been fueling intercommunal violence, uh, uh, and that in the end is destabilizing the whole central region. Uh, and I think actually that's part of the, the strategy of the, uh, um, the jihadists, but I think also that Natasha will go more in depth on that. Um, So we have a problem here with a, a government which uh, uh, is doing counterterrorism, uh, um, but has limited support uh, uh, or yeah, not complete support amongst its population. It has problems with its human rights and good governance records. Uh, it's using militias uh, in, in, in order to deal with uh, the jihadists. Um, and again, we know what can Minuspa do here? Well, uh, um, you know some of the grievances are. Um, about close, yeah. Uh, some of the grievances are legitimate, uh, and uh, uh, um, yeah, it doesn't work to deal with these challenges as as uh, uh, binary, you know, good versus bad. Um, it really means that you can't only support the counterterrorism strategy, um, but it also means that going back to basics is very difficult uh, uh, because you know, in the end, there are jihadists that you have to deal with. So there are uh, essentially three strategic options for the mission on how then to continue. Uh, the first one is draw down and possibly continue as a uh, political mission. Um, that probably will have a, a huge impact uh, um, for uh, particularly the north. Um, stability and, and uh, confidence building in the north because you know, without the military presence, how is that going to continue? Uh, but also for protection of civilians in the center, where it is really needed to have the MINUSMA presence, actually. And it would signal 
the sort of disinterest of the international community. Um, so I think that will be thrown out the baby with the bathwater. Uh, then there is the option of continuing uh, uh, basically the current mission uh, as a stabilization peacekeeping operation. Um, there you actually have a, a number of different varieties of how you can do that. You can continue to focus mainly on the north um, and keep all with equal resources uh, and sort of continue to ignore the, the problems in the center. Um, that risks in the end that, uh, uh, um, you know, if, if the center further destabilizes, the, the north may eventually be sort of disconnected uh, uh, and break away again. You could uh, uh, focus on the center with equal resources, uh, and hopefully that is going to work then for the center. Um, but uh, uh, um, again, you know, with, with insufficient attention for the north, then that is going to spiral out of control again, potentially. Uh, there is the option of focusing on both uh, and uh, with the same resources. Uh, and that's basically muddling through as we do it right now. Um, and what you see is a sort of slow process of, of uh, 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 destabilization going on at the moment. Uh, and, uh, um, well, maybe at least that prevents the complete breakup of the, uh, of the country. Uh, but it is not ideal. And then last but not least, as a variety here, uh, uh, focus on both, but with more resources. Uh, of course, it will mean that you know uh, the, the 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 parties may actually continue to dodge some of the responsibilities, um, but you know it has the best chance of dealing with the northern problems and the confidence building can then continue as well as uh, dealing with the protection of civilian issues in the center. Now, the very last option is an option uh, that is clearly preferred by the Malian government and is clearly preferred by uh, uh, um, uh, the regional governments, let's say and that is the option where the mission actually readjusts completely and goes into counter-terrorism and deal with the counter, well, with the terrorists and the rebels. Uh, there you have two options again. Either you do it in the Amazon way, it's a regional force uh, with logistical support um, uh, from the UN, sort of uh, in some situation, or you have the, the, the MONUSCO situation where you have a force intervention brigade uh, attached to the MINUSMA mission. Um, that was actually the original idea behind the, the current joint, uh, the G5 Sahel force, um, that, you know, you have a counterterrorism force linked into uh, uh, MINUSMA. Um, that would at least mean that, you know, the, the, the counterterrorism uh, strategy is better embedded into the international strategy. Uh, you have a good chance that it is uh, more legitimate, and you have a good chance that um, uh, um, the human rights due diligence policy is actually followed up better. Um, but at the same time, the G5 Sahel force in Mali is mainly the, f uh, the, the force of the Malien. Um, it's the government forces. Uh, and um, they are not perceived to be security providers in the whole of the country, let's say. Um, plus, particularly in the center, uh, uh, but uh, yeah, uh, plus the other thing is the problem in the center is not militarily. It is not a military problem. The problem in the center is the breakdown of the social contract and not going to solve that with just military force. I'll stop there. Sorry for t taking too much time. <laughs> Thank you, Ayer, and uh, please uh, join us on the panel. And I'm going to ask Sharon and, and uh, Natasha also to um, just join us on the panel. We'll take a slightly different format. Um, what I will suggest is that we will just uh, go into the panel format now, but uh, ask uh, Sharon and Natasha to, to start us off with uh, their reflections, and then we'll go into questions and answers. So, first of all, uh, Sharon Wiharta, as uh, Yahir mentioned, uh, spent uh, the last, uh, almost uh, recently, the last three years 
in the United Nations mission in Mali as the best practice officer of the mission. And uh, she happened to be there when the Airpon team visited uh, last year as well and, and served as, as one of the hosts for the team. But she has since uh, left the mission and she's now working with, uh, in the Challenges Forum International Secretariat in Sweden. So she's here in her personal capacity, not speaking on behalf of the UN, but uh, we would like to, to very much to hear her reflections on uh, comments on the report, if she has any, but also her own reflections on the effectiveness of the mission. Thank you very much, Sharon. Thank you, Cedric, uh, very much for the invitation. Um, it's a pleasure to be at uh, NUPI in, in, in particular, since NUPI is one of uh, the Challenges Forum um, partners. Um, and thank you also for, um, so again, let me just preface my remarks by saying these are my personal uh, reflections, and they don't represent um, the mission, the UN, or Challenges Forum. Um, so I just wanted to, um, to build um, on, on Yair's um, uh, uh, presentation and also um, in response and thinking about, uh, you started off uh, describing the EPON presentation, uh, EPON approach to evaluate or to, to look at the effectiveness of um, peacekeeping in specific context, uh, given the resources that they have and looking at the, at the uh, mandated issues that they are tasked to, to implement. Um, and you started by saying the overall strategic impact of the mission and, and whether it is to, to reduce conflict. I think at, um, at the very sort of um, basic point, we look at the impact of MINUSMA has been that um, it's played a large role in keeping the country uh, together. And you, you said that yourself. Uh, without it, uh, I think we'll likely um, see um, the, the fear is that uh, you would have a breakaway region. And that was the intent, I think, of the mission. Uh, originally was to uh, ensure um, territorial integrity and to reduce the conflict um, in the north. Um, but certainly that's, that's a very um, baseline objective and expectations um, evolve and grow over the years as the mission um, is, um, is in place. So I think that that's a fundamental question that we all struggle with, I think, in the peacekeeping community, is how do, how do you look at an impact of a mission uh, or peacekeeping when expectations continue to evolve and you're measured against, in, in many respect, uh, to events that are happening uh, right now. So the perception of, of the effectiveness of MINUSMA on protection of civilians is, is measured against what's happening right now, when certainly one would argue that it, from, from the perspective in, in New York and in, in Security Council two years ago, that was um, a priority, but not a top priority in terms of implementing the peace process. So I think we'll, we'll always have to play that catch up uh, in terms of um, looking at effectiveness. Um, then I just want to uh, respond, I suppose, to, um, to your findings um, of, um, of the impact uh, of the mission. Um, I built these on, on, uh, on the executive summary of, uh, of the report in, in your earlier presentation. And we look at the explanatory factors that, that you've highlighted in terms of um, um, people, or certainly the EPON methodology of the people-centered uh, approach, um, the legitimacy um, issue, um, and protection of uh, civilians. Um, I think there's less, uh, let's, let's take a look at uh, the people-centric uh, approach, uh, which is something that the HIPPO report um, really highlighted and we all aim, uh, or not, we, uh, as a community aim to, to improve on. Um, and your comment about, and certainly this, not yours, so, uh, but there's a general um, sense that um, the mission is bunkerized and it doesn't get out there and that it only patrols um, in urban areas. Um, and that is true. I don't think we're disputing that. 
but again, I think we, we want to look at um, very much in the way that South Sudan was set up, perhaps, was what were the issues at hand and how the mission was set up was to, um, to be largely present in the urban areas uh, in the north. And that's not to say that the mission doesn't go out. It does go out. It goes out to the most remote parts of the country. Um, it goes to Andrambukan, which is at the very border between Mali and Niger, um, from the nearest base in Menaka, which takes about four hours by road, if I'm not um, mistaken. The point uh, that I would like to make here is that um, when we look at the impact or effectiveness, um, even at a very basic questions of are we getting there, are we getting out there enough to engage with the communities that we need to engage with, what are the transactional costs of doing that? Um, and, and so in, a, in an environment like Mali where uh, we do face asymmetric threats, I think the political grandmasters in New York, uh, the, the various um, member states um, that support the mission should also accept that there are high operational costs of doing um, these mandated tasks. And so I suppose it's a balance, uh, it's also subjective, it's, uh, it's carrying out your mandated tasks um, and also recognizing that it means more resources are necessary to do this. And I don't just mean quantity, but also sort of the right um, resources fit for purpose. Um, there are, um, um, so, 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 that's, uh, so that's one. Um, and I would argue as well that um, the tension um, you raise in terms of the mission um, focusing on state building um, issues uh, in terms of supporting uh, the extension or restoration of state authority in the country is, uh, is less of a tension um, in terms, in relation to the people-centric approach. I suppose if we conceptualize in terms of the three tiers of protection of civilians, um, the mission's support to the state of and trying to facilitate that restoration or extension of state authority is very much also geared towards the, the objective of, of, um, of improving um, um, uh, people's lives and, and um, protecting um, civilians. So I don't necessarily um, see that as mutually exclusive or that tension as, as you seem to um, suggest and perhaps maybe I've, I've gotten that um, wrong so in, in which case I, I, I do apologize. Um, and you raise a related point about the legitimacy of the, of the government and the mission whether or not it should link or de-link um, with the government. I think the mission is not um, is not unique as with other missions. We see that um, the mandate is to support the authority. So I don't think the answer is to is whether or not to de-link from the from the government because I uh, these will continue to be mandated tasks. I think, um, but it is to ensure that the type of state that we support uh, are are increasingly seen to be legitimate by the population, uh, by the communities um, that are meant to be served. And certainly it's not then to disengage or reduce our engagement with um, government authorities, but to adjust our engagement such that these issues are raised um, for good um, or bad. Um, so I think, um, um, again, just as an added um, point on, on, on your reflections on this delinking with, with the government, um, one thing that the mission um, focuses a lot um, is support to both, to all the different parties to the conflict and to the peace agreement. Um, it engages and particularly the mission leadership, both uh, the SRSG and the various uh, and, and the uh, deputy special representative uh, political um, engages impartially with both government actors and, um, and the armed groups to 
correlates them to continue uh, 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 dialoguing and talking and trying to move the political process forward. Now, admittedly, uh, I'm not suggesting that um, a uh, that it has got it progress. Uh, we we take that progress has been slow. Um, and there's uh, frustrations on, on many levels, uh, both uh, by the population um, both, uh, as well as international community actors um, who, who are, um, um, I suppose, eager for a, a quicker uh, um, implementation and progress of, of, uh, of that. Um, one other thing that I wanted to um, to suppose mention as well um, the the timeline that you ha uh, that the report um, I suppose highlighted from the cutoff of two thousand and sixteen as being less um, effective or maybe lower impact um, and I'm sure you go to to more nuanced uh, uh, um, finding in in the, in the larger report, but I think it's also from 2000, at least for a period between 2016 and 2017, was also a period where um, the mission um, faced uh, a higher level of um, attacks, um, and in that context of still trying to implement your mandate in that context um, would, uh, I suppose, uh, the effectiveness would, would prob like you say, would, um, would, uh, would be impinged or, or, or limited. Um, the, the, the one thing that we also uh, should um, in terms of, um, of, of the political uh, good offices uh, that you um, that was mentioned in <coughs> the report um, is the 2018 um, elections, the the presidential elections. Actually, let me take a pause. Is that 18? Yes. <laughs> Thank you very much. Sometimes uh, uh, the years are, are a blur. Um, the 2018 elections, where it was a potential flashpoint um, in the country, um, the, the elections themselves were recognized to be in a post-conflict situation fairly fair fairly credible. There were a lot of criticisms um, that it, w it could have been more free and more fair. Um, but the one thing that the mission contributed was ensuring that the results of the elections uh, were accepted by all parties and that um, that involved um, uh, an intense and um, a high degree of engagement in, t in terms of supporting the primacy of politics and to ensure that the peace process or the political process um, and, a, and a milestone such as uh, a presidential elections didn't fall apart um, uh, at all. Uh, and I think um, that while it is due to, to the in intense um, and um, good offices by, by, by the mission. It's also the presence of the force that you could ensure uh, that um, such, um, uh, such good offices uh, will, be, will be accepted. Um, okay, thanks very much. Um, so I'm coming, uh, coming back again. Um, I, I, I come back again. I come back again to the point of um, POC, um, where you say, you know, the mission needs to start uh, looking at um, serious, um, looking at how it can address um, these issues. And like you say, um, the early warning was raised for that the, that the situation was escalating uh, tensions in, in, in central um, Mali. 
Um, I think the steps that, uh, uh, that the mission, so most recently, uh, sorry, just, uh, just the example of, of the mission's support to, to the state authority in that um, there was an incident earlier this year in January where um, about 37 civilians were, were killed uh, in, in Mopti, in, um, I believe it was in the Bankas uh, district. Now, what's Im important in this example is that the Malian judicial authorities actually went out to a very remote part of central uh, Mali and investigated um, the incident um, and actually apprehended suspects. And um, the, I think cases are now ongoing in terms of prosecuting um, uh, this, um, this incident. So, um, I think when we, uh, it's often easy to look at effectiveness uh, or the impact of mission on um, the short term sort of physical um, protection, um, sort of the very visible efforts. And I think the capacity building sort of longer term um, support that the international community through, through the missions give uh, is less visible and I think these these are um, issues that we should also these are things that we should also be um, looking at um, I'll, I'll just close on the fact that uh, I'll just close with um, I think effectiveness I'd like you rightly pointed out in in the Mali case um, is not linear and so while we maybe see, while we see a dip, it's, it's ebbing and flowing in, in many of the contexts. I think when we, we should also remember that during the ebb, that there are initiatives, there are longer term structural efforts to ensure that uh, the uh, upward progression um, hopefully uh, takes place. So, thanks. Thank you very much, Sharon. We're going to turn now to uh, Natasha Rupasinghe. Natasha is a, a colleague here at NUPI. Uh, she's been working uh, with us on, on various uh, peacekeeping-related programs, especially the Training for Peace Project and, and EPON. Um, Natasha, in addition to having been a member of the team that uh, Yair led into the, U the effectiveness of the UN mission in Mali, has also been part of a number of other research projects uh, in Mali and in the Sahel looking especially at violent extremism and she's in fact just uh, very recently returned from from another bout of field work in Bamako. So uh, I think she's going to reflect especially for us on, on, the, on the situation in the center and, and some of the dynamics influencing that. So Natasha, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, yeah, so I want to kind of zoom in on central Mali. Um, you've heard it many times throughout the presentation. Um, and I think it's important to focus on this because it's going to be a key issue that will come up um, when discussing the renewal of the mandate, whether the mission should focus on the north, whether they should reprioritize and go to the center, or you know whether they can kind of model through and focus on both. Um, so it's important to remember that um, you know, MINUSMA was initially called in to stabilize the north. Um, but while it's been deployed in the country, um, security has been rapidly deteriorating, as you've heard. Um, and I think this really speaks to, to the point that Sharon highlighted about, you know, the difficulty in evolving to rapidly changing dynamics once a mandate is set. Um, 2018 has been the most violent year in Mali since the conflict broke out, and this is largely due to violence in central Mali. The region is at the moment gripped by a um, spiraling cycle of violence by jihadist insurgents and a number of uh, self-defense militias which have proliferated, in addition to um, counter-terror operations launched by the uh, Malian government since approximately 2018. Um, com Inter-community violence has reached unprecedented levels in the country. Um, and unfortunately, the trend that we're seeing is that um, violence is slowly turning towards more targeting of civilians. So in Mali, probably up until 2015, the armed actors, notably the <coughs> 
you know, what the mission refers to as terrorist armed groups or the jihadist insurgents, um, did not engage in indiscriminate violence against the civilian population. Um, I'm not saying that they didn't engage in violence. There's definitely, they've definitely used coercion and have engaged in abusive activities towards the civilian population, but it's been by and large selective. Um, so what we're seeing now is an uptick in violence against civilians by all sides of the conflict, including self-defense militias and also by the jihadist insurgents active in the region. Um, and I want to just highlight why this is important. Why is the destabilization of central Mali so critical um, to the conflict? Um, so the first thing to note is that the center is really where all communities in Mali meet. You have um, ethnic groups living side by side, Fulani, Bambara, Dogon, Malinke, Bozo, they all come together in the center. And it's also much more populous than the north. You have over five million people living here. So having this kind of destabilization will clearly have dramatic humanitarian ramifications. Um, it is also a, a region with high economic stakes, so um, it's basically a commercial hub and a food basket, which is very important for Mali's national economy. Um, and the destabilization of the region actually risks breaking up the, inter the territorial integrity of the country. Many people talk about central Mali as being really the bridge between the south and the north. Um, so how has this situation arisen. Um, while international actors have focused largely on stabilizing the North, which was the pressing issue at hand when they deployed, um, jihadist insurgents um, have actually regrouped in areas of central Mali. They've launched um, a campaign of targeted violence um, directed towards the state, but also against all non-collaborators and this has had the effect of actually hollowing out further the relatively absent state authority in these areas creating um, a space which has facilitated their expansion um, and in a report that I've uh, recently launched with a colleague of mine Professor Morten Burse at, at NUPI um, we've been trying to understand how a jihadist insurgent group like this has been so successful in becoming so integrated in communities. Um, so the group that, that is, I would say, the most influential jihadist actor in the center at the moment um, is the Katiba Masina, um, which is led by a Fulani uh, preacher by the name of Hamadun Kufa, who has been a preacher who has been very active in the region long before the conflict broke out. Um, and he's very well, well respected and is considered to be, um, was considered to be a legitimate person um, before uh, resorting to violence. Now this group is, it has a more local agenda, but it is also linked to the Al-Qaeda affili affiliated uh, umbrella organization group for support of Islam and Muslims, which is one of the most uh, pertinent um, destabilizing terror groups in Mali at the moment. Um, and these, this group operates um, kind of as decentralized small battalions, but they all take command from Kufa. And they've recruited um, mainly, but I stress not only, from the, the Fulani pastoralist community. Um, but I would say it's, it's very important to remember that this is not a, at the heart of it an ethnic conflict. This is a conflict about governance, about resources, about deep-seated frustrations and grievances that have been simmering for a very, very long time. Um, another thing that's important to note, I think, which is interesting when we look at um, a peacekeeping mission, which is deploying into a context of counterinsurgency, and when it is partnering with the state, and it is supporting the state in its actions, is that state responses to this group um, have played a role in their uh, expansion. Um, a turning point, I would say, for this uh, jihadist insurgency was actually the clampdown of the Fulani pastoralist community following um, uh, the, the deployment of Serval. Um, 
which basically amounted to some kind of ethnic profiling against uh, Fulani herdsmen as being jihadists, um, leading to mass arrests, torture, abuse, which have been well documented by uh, Human Rights Watch, for instance. Um, and these dynamics continue today, and they continue to fuel radicalization and push these communities towards that group. Um, another key point to, to that we've found about this group is that they don't emerge um, in a vacuum. They thrive on existing conflicts and local cleavages. Um, as Yair mentioned, they have been very successful in instrumentalizing um, resource-based conflicts between herders and farmers. But they have been extremely effective also in tapping into widespread grievances against the state in this region. Um, they've tapped into feelings of humiliation, people who have been um, basically humiliated by abusive state practices such as tax collection or harassment by forest agents. Um, and this has actually afforded them with some type of legitimacy among local communities. Um, and what they've done is they've managed to establish pervasive social control. So you don't see that they have a, you know, um, a very visible military territorial control in Mopti and in the region. But what they have managed to do is become completely interlinked and integrated among communities. And they're able to socially control without actually having to be present. Um, and how, so how have they done this? They haven't just done this by coercing the civilian population, which has, of course, been an important part of their governance strategy. But they've also, for instance, provided justice on the spot, which is a very, which contrasts to the very uh, ineffective and corrupt justice provided by the state. They have, for instance, um, lowered or abolished access fees to dry season pastures, which has been very popular for pastoralists who are used to paying high access fees for instance, to access these. Um, they have also established a very pervasive informal systems, uh, system of surveillance as a means of enforcing their rules. So when you talk to people who have fled from these areas, what they are most afraid of are basically what they call the, um, the dormant cells. Or these are basically the informants who have been appointed by the jihadists to survey the community and report back if anyone is breaking the rules. Um, and so this situation, their growing expansion, has basically uh, triggered self-defense militias to take up arms, claiming that if they, they had to do so because the government response was inadequate. And what you've seen is this um, kind of cycle of uh, violence, very much informed by um, a logic of retaliation and revenge, now... Um, uh, going on between communities who have for a very long time actually existed together. But what you're seeing now is a total breakdown of trust uh, between these communities, um, which is obviously very difficult to repair, this kind of suspicion. Um, so lastly, I just want to talk a little bit about um, what has been the response to this uh, progressively aggravating uh, security situation. Um, unfortunately, MINUSMA has been playing catch-up to these evolving dynamics. Um, Central Mali was not in, explicitly incorporated in, into the peace agreement, although technically the agreement um, covers the whole of the country. Um, despite the fact that you know, parts of Central Mali were actually under uh, jihadist occupation, during the 2012-2013 conflict. Um, it was officially included into MINUSMA's mandate in, ju in June 2018. Um, and when, when trying to understand sort of, you know, how, what has the mission's response been, um, there have been a couple of issues that have come up and key challenges. Um, the first was that um, the response has been, the strategic priority of the mission has been implementing the peace agreement in the north. 
And unfortunately, this has amounted to some kind of tunnel vision um, on the north. Um, and someone, as someone once described to me, and I will keep it anonymous, but I think it's a fantastic quote, um, Minusma resembles the Titanic. Even though it sees an iceberg ahead, it is very difficult to change direction once the strategic priorities are set. Um, so, you know, responding to these evolving dynamics in practice is actually extremely difficult and cumbersome. Um, secondly, they've had to face the challenge of the fact that the state, the Malian government, has basically objected time and time and again to international involvement in this region. They're, they've, you know, time and time even denied that there is a problem here. And if they do talk about a problem, it is purely through the lens of terrorism. So this also again highlights the very, you know, real challenge that a UN peacekeeping mission faces. The government remains entitled to basically, you know, flag its sovereignty card um, when it suits. So in that context, um, a government can block the kind of really impactful interventions that are actually really, that, and, you know, and, and take up issues that really matter. They're very much constrained in that space. Um, lastly, I, I just want to touch on, um, you know, the other kind of responses that we've seen in the center up until now. Um, the government has launched um, a regional stabilization plan, but this has um, largely constituted um, a military redeployment to areas affected by insecurity. Now, this has had mixed results. It has been um, successful in pushing the jihadist insurgents to retreat, um, but it has been difficult for them to maintain a more permanent presence, which is what is needed, because once the army um, leaves, the civilian population are often subject to um, retaliation violence by the jihadists. And while the jihadist insurgents have retreated into, their, into the bush, into the training camps, they're still there. So it hasn't really solved um, the problem. And I think this reveals that, you know, as Yair finished with, um, the problem in the center is really not a military one. But despite this, we still see a ramping up of counter-terror operations. And I'm not saying that, um, that we don't need a military presence, because we absolutely do. When you talk to communities living in the region, the one priority that they highlight is that they would like a much stronger security presence. But I think the key question, um, you know, as you highlighted as well, is what kind of security presence is that going to be? Is it going to be considered a credible and legitimate force? Or is it going to be considered a force that is only there to basically prey on the local population and make the situation worse. So I think for me that is something so key and I don't think I have the answer <laughs> or it's difficult to have uh, an answer to that question. Um, and lastly, I think I really want to push this point, um, you know, is it time to consider dialogue with these actors? And I think there is room for even considering, um, you know, some pragmatic dialogue, even if it's not going to be on a much larger, you know, ideological scale about the, fu the future of the country. At the moment, I think it is possible to engage in dialogue with these actors um, to basically alleviate some of the suffering of the civilian population. Because at the moment, you know, people are really struggling, civilians are living under embargo in some areas. Um, and and experience up until now has shown that some local initiatives has succeeded in actually um, making compromises with these actors. Um, so I think there is more room uh, to pursue that line of action. Thank you. Thank you very much, Natasha. And I think that really helped to clarify the context within which we can you know, reflect on the effectiveness of, of the UN mission in, in Mali. Uh, colleagues, I'm sorry, we've uh, really been uh, running over time. Uh, if any of you have to leave, we will completely understand that. But we will, for those of you that can remain a few minutes longer, <coughs> um, take a series of questions. So I, I'll take one round of questions and then one round of, round of replies. I'll start here with Adam. Thanks. Is this on? No. It says it's on. Okay. 
Adam Day with you in university. Uh, yeah, you're, I really liked your beginning where you said there are narratives you can tell with the data. And I think that's a good kind of emblem for what Epon's trying to do. I'd like to provoke a bit by offering another narrative I might be able to tell with your data that leads into Natasha's point. And that would be that in 2013, there was a natural lull in hostilities as the parties thought about what they might be able to get out of the agreement. <coughs> That usually happens following a, a peace agreement. And that explains the lull for a year and a half or two years. Towards 2015, they saw they weren't going to get what they wanted out of the agreement. And you see hostilities rise again. And actually, MINUSMA had essentially zero impact on that. I'm just offering a potential narrative. And that by focusing on the North and by shoring up the North, what actually happened was MINUSMA encouraged the parties to push into the center where there's actually a much more dangerous cocktail of groups and lack of state capacity. And you see much larger scale attacks like the one with the Fulani that happened a few months ago. And w a narrative I could tell with the data is actually MINUSMA has made things worse by focusing on the north and allowing that more dangerous area to flourish. And some of Natasha's points, I think, might actually support that, that narrative. And I wonder if, if you did a hypothetical and said MINUSMA never showed up, would it actually be that the conflict would have stayed in the north where there was a slightly greater state capacity to deal with it and it would have been bad but potentially better than the spike we have now which is actually higher than it was in 2012 before the peace agreement um, and I'd like uh, your re reaction maybe you can just say no if you don't agree with me. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much Adam. Let's go to Ilara at the back then. Hi, Marie Sannes um, from PRIO. Um, it was mentioned in the first presentation that there is a link between MINUSMA and the French Barkhane and the joint force of the G5. So I was wondering if you could expand a little bit about what this link is, if it is coordination or cooperation or what it is, and what does that then mean for MINUSMA to operate as a neutral actor in Mali? Thank you very much. And then Mark over here. Thank you. Uh, Mark Lantain, University of Tromsø. Uh, I'm just wondering if the panel could comment about the economic challenges, which can be directly related to um, both security in Mali and the potential success of MINUSMA. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Economic challenges. Economic challenge. Over here, please, and then. Yeah, as the economic point has been mentioned, and I think that's a really good point as well, uh, that um, there's also efforts to for for um, infrastructure and and resilience. Um, I would like to rather point towards the personal question that I had: um, Is Minusma really acting as a homogeneous, unified uh, actor? Or is there a lot of difference within within the different actors? I mean, there's a lot of countries involved um, in in those uh, missions. So that would be my question. I'm a student currently staying in Oslo. I'm originally from the Netherlands. Thank you. Thank you very much. And one more colleague from the Norwegian Research Council. Hi. Hi. Refugee Thank Council. <laughs> <laughs> my question is to Natasha on the context. Uh, thank you for the very deep uh, analysis. And I wonder whether you saw any regional, strong regional links of what is happening in central Mali with the peak of conflict in Burkina Faso, even in some parts of Niger, and also in the north of Nigeria, Lake Chad, etc. Because we were also wondering whether we were also treating it country by country. Uh, is this the right approach, or should we look at uh, Sahel crisis with similar dynamics? What do you think? And last question with Anna Sherstein, from, from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Uh, thank you. I was just, I think that very much what you say points also to the responsibility of the government of Mali, and I think that could perhaps be given more attention than what you have been doing both in the UNMIS report and also this one. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, let's go to the panel, maximum maybe three minutes each if we can. Um, yeah. I'd like to start. I'll, I'll start, I okay. think. Uh, on, on the government, uh, uh, I think you're very right. Uh, and I was actually thinking, you know, we, mm, we're we pretty harsh on the government, maybe even. But, um, well, we should talk about that later, maybe. Um, but I, I think, yeah, you're right. The, the government, I think, is key here, and it's it's uh, uh, not ideal for the moment. On, uh, 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 I'll, I'll try to 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 
put a couple of things together. Um, yeah, the mission definitely has, uh, you know, in different periods, it has different mandates, it has different levels of success. Uh, if you look at the North-South, um, I would actually still say that by and large it's relatively successful. Um, you know, if C is what UNMIS gets, uh, MINUSMA definitely gets the C, and I think actually for... <laughs> wow! <laughs> <laughs> But uh, now let me finish here, <laughs> because I think for, for a mission, if you look at you know, the complex environments they are uh, 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 deployed in, the, the difficult tasks that they have, if you even you know, get a little bit of your mandate done, you're a huge success. Um, I think actually that if you look at the North-South conflict, uh, the Algiers agreement that by and large is, is still working. Uh, there is you no know, slow process, but these processes are very difficult. Um, and I think that the MINUSMA plays a role there. It is the center where currently the main challenge is, uh, but in the center, you know, it, again, only since 2018 does the mission have the mandate to actually deal with it. It's not necessary, or not necessarily, I mean, you know, MINUSMA has been uh, 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 pointing out all the time that there is a challenge here, we have to do something about it. It couldn't do anything without the mandate. Um, interesting in both missions that the situation changed whilst the missions were deployed and then you know had to adapt and it's not necessarily the kind of mission you would have deployed or designed for that problem that later emerged but the missions had to adapt as I think you've reflected on. Yeah, I'll, I'll, uh, um, so I, I, I uh, now let me quickly in between answer your question on the <laughs> hypothetical. Uh, um, I don't uh, I, I would not say that it has made things worse because, uh, um, uh, you know, it has been successful dealing with the challenge of, of let's say, the, the, the signatory parties, relatively speaking. Uh, but there were groups that were not part of it and they have then caused the challenge. So, you know, there is a dip in violence. Um, yeah, I, I, would, I would not link that to the, li uh, to the parties. And, and say, you know, well, they shifted their attention to the center. The, but here I think that Natasha would have a much better answer, hopefully. Um, but I think it's more now the jihadist groups outside of the agreement that actually were able to make use of the situation. Now, I think that if you, if you talk about uh, uh, um, MINUSMA being the iceberg or the Titanic, uh, I think that is actually not really fair. Um, so now I'm really going to defend MINUSMA here. Um, I think that you know levels of, of uh, 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 effectiveness uh, change, but um, it also means that you know different situations require different kind of capabilities. The situation in the north requires very different capabilities from the situation in the center. You need to have uh, uh, um, mobile forces. You need to be much more flexible. Um, which is really difficult if you actually don't have those troops, if you don't have the troop contributing countries that are actually willing to do this, that have those capabilities. Um, so uh, uh, um, that's one thing. Um, what was the other one that I... Oh yeah, on, on bunkerization, uh, again there, that is also very uh, uh, important I think. Um, I think that uh, um, you're, you're completely right. The situation became much more dangerous. If you look at MINUSMA, uh, it, it is the mission with the, uh, the highest number of uh, uh, fatalities due to hostile acts, uh, uh, particularly if you compare it to the numbers of troops deployed in, in recent years. Um, the troops were not prepared for that. The bulk of the troops are actually uh, 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 countries from the region. They don't have the capabilities to actually, you know, uh, they don't have the necessary uh, uh, um, um, APCs, for example, or uh, um, they didn't have the training, the IED training. So the mission actually had to catch up. Um, and I can imagine, again, you know, given the difficult uh, 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 conflict environment, that mission the, t the troop contributing countries were not always that interested in actually doing what was required for them later on. Um, I wouldn't call it bunkerization. Well, it is, of course, it is bunkerization. 
Uh, but there is a reason for that, and without the right resources, you cannot do a lot more uh, than what you're saying. You know, you have the groups that can actually go out, and uh, uh, and that is actually extremely dangerous. Um, then uh, uh, one last thought. Yeah, yeah. And then the other last, the last thing is uh, a lot of these things are dilemmas. So when yeah. you talk about um, delinking the government from uh, uh, no minus not from government or completely supporting it, it's a dilemma. And I think uh, uh, you cannot actually. And same with counterterrorism. I think actually, you know, uh, uh, the mission is is tied also to Barkhan in a way because it's co-locating, it is uh, exchanging information, um, um, and it's part of a broader strategy. I think in the end, uh, uh, and broader international strategy. I think you can, you know, these are dilemmas. I don't think you can actually say, you know, a mission can deploy in a country without being linked to the government. It's impossible. Um, same thing, you can't really completely support it in all ways because the, the government is not inclusive yet. You cannot say, uh, we're going to ignore the jihadists. Um, but at the same time, you know also that you know the situation means that you're also going to be perceived by some as being partial. Uh, that's the big challenge. Thank you very much, Sharon. Um, just a couple of quick points. Um, I think on Adam's question uh, on whether the mission made it was I think. It, in terms of that lull, and certainly with the, the early analysis that things were brewing in, in the center, um, I would suggest that it's, it's a definite missed window of opportunity to go in um, and try to find out more information, to, to have um, dialogue with the commu uh, communities and to find out who these potential spoilers or, or these actors that are potential spoilers to, to the larger um, uh, political process. The problem in Mopti is, and, and different to other um, conflict settings, is um, these are not identified, self-identified uh, groups other than in um, uh, Katiba Masina, where you have maybe one. It's, it's also not a centralized um, um, arm group with with um, definitive hierarchy. These are very fragmented armed uh, groups to the extent that they that they arm groups uh, as well and, and not just um, um, groups that employ um, terror attacks. So how do you engage and how do you have that dialogue when you also don't know who your potential, who, who you could have that dialogue? So I think that's um, that uh, that's a challenge. Uh, that's certainly something that um, the mission and, and other actors on the ground um, could um, do better and more uh, to ensure that. So I take you. I think we take you. Uh, take your point. I think that there was a definite uh, coll pre colleagues who who served in that time. Uh, also, you know, where there was more freedom of movement for the mission, and again, that perception and that uh, popular acceptance by the population uh, of the mission, uh, we should have capitalized. Uh, the mission should have capitalized uh, on that. Um, uh, and the hypothet did it make? Perhaps I, I don't know. I, I wouldn't uh, uh, dare to, to answer that. Um, I think the question on, on co-location or coordination with, with the other actors, uh, the, the mission is, is just a, uh, the mission is mandated um, to support uh, logistically uh, the G5 uh, Sahel force. Um, in, in, in its uh, so that means just uh, secondary uh, logistical uh, support. Um, it is, as the report uh, mentions, uh, co-located in, in some areas. Um, um, and what it means for the mission, um, certainly it has a negative, um, I feel, negative impact on, uh, on the perception uh, of, by the population on, on the legitimacy it has, it has made, um, um, it has further blurred the lines, I think, of, of what the mission uh, is supposed to be doing or and what the mission is actually doing. Uh, you spoke about this in terms of, of some, um, some, some constituencies wanting the mission to do something that's clearly not set, not clearly not mandated um, to do. Um, 
And uh, in, in, in very real uh, and, and practically, it has uh, certainly um, impinged on, on the mission, affected the, uh, the mission in, in terms of how, how it operates uh, the, and whether or not uh, the mission is uh, attacked. Maybe just one point. One, more. yeah. Um, uh, unified actors in, in, uh, in MINUSMA, yes, the whole one UN, and certainly um, we, can, we can take that uh, uh, offline. I think I want, uh, my, my last, um, uh, so, uh, just make coming uh, back to, to Yair's uh, point, is that um, I, I think in the report you talk about Brahimi, um, you know, the Brahimi report saying that missions should um, tell the Security Council um, what it needs to know uh, and not what it wants to hear. Uh, I would push that the Security Council and member states should listen to what it needs to know and not just listen to what it wants to hear. Um, certainly because in some cases I think other actors, not just the mission, uh, uh, do do send that um, uh, flag flag the issues, and I think for any effectiveness, if you um, permit me, um, again generally with 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 other missions is um, to deploy. It needs to do the things that the explanatory factors that has been laid out in in, in the report is. It's not just about um, not just about the number of helicopters, etc., but it certainly shows it affects the operational ability of the mission to do these things. So if we want to look at um, uh, effectiveness, I think we also need to, instead of achievable mandates, also realistic expectations of what missions can achieve. And going into that, also then recognizing and accepting sort of the collective responsibility of what it takes to equip the missions to be effective. And this means sending the right type of resources in a timely manner that's fit for purpose, fit for context, um, political uh, support and political coherence, either uh, both on the ground in terms of the different actors, as well as with the political grandmasters um, in New York. Not uh, not anything new, but <coughs> thank you very much, Sharon, and then Natasha. Um, yeah, okay, I'll be very quick. Um, just on on Adam's point, I mean, I'm not going to dare to answer that question either. <laughs> but um, I think there's there's a, I mean, I'll just offer two perspectives. I mean, there are those who believe that um, Minusma has made things worse. Um, based on the number of um, attacks that we've seen against the mission. So in that sense, you could argue that in some sense they're kind of attracting um, more instability rather than being an anchor for stability. Um, but interestingly, um, the, these dynamics that are going on in central Mali and particularly the um, radicalization dynamics have been going on um, long before the conflict even broke out. And I would say even, you know, from 2010, 2011, um, people talk about very sort of sense, you know, sensibilization, kind of very soft um, approach of these groups coming and visiting villages and trying to sensitize people to their message. So I think in the, in the terms of, you know, if we can even speculate about what the grander scheme behind these groups is, I think plans for the center have been there, you know, long before the crisis, long before the mission was even there. Um, and yeah, I would just I just wanted to say um, one thing on on the perception um, of Minusma, given that it does provide this logistical support to the G5, given that it is co-located with Barkan, um, there there is also some limited information sharing um, with Barkan, although this is not reciprocated <laughs> by Barkan. Um, uh, but I think um, one important thing to note there is that I think that the mission has to some extent been co-opted by this kind of counter-terror lens, in a sense, um, by the way that it defines and categorizes the different conflict actors in Mali, you know, tags, terrorist armed groups, those are the jihadist actors. Um, but, you know, what we argue in the report is that, that these are much more complex actors who are also governance actors. and. Um, 
and you know it's much it's it's impossible to categorize these actors um, in in such a binary way. Um, and lastly, just on the the point about um, whether one sees similarities between Burkina, what's going on in Burkina and Niger. Um, I think there's definitely uh, similarity, similarities between kind of the, the modus operandi of these groups like the Katiba Masina um, and Ansarul Islam, for instance, who is operating in Burkina um, and the Islamic State in the Greater Sahara, which is very active in Niger. Um, the commonalities that you can see between these groups is, again, that they really thrive on the local context. Um, so they're very effective in creating division and stoking existing intercommunal tensions. You've seen the same kind of um, attacks against state representatives. You've seen the same kind of attacks against um, Western education. You've had the same, um, you know, you've had, uh, uh, you know, hundreds of schools who have been also uh, shut down in Burkina. Um, so I think it's important to, to sort of keep that transnational view, but I would really argue that these dynamics are inherently local and you can already see in Mali um, you know large discrepancies between um, jihadist actors in the north and in the center and when you you know kind of dig de even deeper you see huge discrepancies in the way that they operate um, at kind of district level and at the level of the sec like the really local level so I think it's it's really key to to keep the analysis anchored um, in the local yeah Thank you very much, Natasha, and thank you for the panel. I think they deserve a hand of thanks from all of us. So. And thank you to all of you for joining us this morning on this uh, International Day of UN Peacekeeping. I think we recognize in the project that you know, peacekeeping, especially United Nations peacekeeping, is seen as an important instrument for the international community in terms of maintenance of national peace and security. Um, and that whilst in general peacekeeping operations statistically and so forth seem to you know, have a, a, an important contribution to reducing violence and prolonging uh, peace processes or the effect of peace processes, we do recognize in particular contexts, especially the ones we're trying to tackle, uh, that, the, that the challenge of these operations to be effective is, is really immense. And that is why we've embarked on this process. We've done four of these studies already, four more underway. We hope to continue over time. And we hope that over time this will improve our collective knowledge on, on what influences the effectiveness of these peace operations. So thank you very much for your engagement again. Thank you.